Beauty consultant Claire Bernal glanced up at the clock and smiled. Her long workday was nearly over. Suddenly, her colleague's expression changed abruptly to one of horror as a man crept up behind Claire, pressed a gun to the back of her head, and... Imagine working at one of the world's largest luxury department stores. As you pass through the glass doors, you enter an oasis of perfume and cosmetics, footwear, clothing, handbags, home decor, and everything else that could be sold in such a center. For one young woman, this was her dream job. Here, she was completely in her element until one summer evening when her life was cut short in an instant. This story makes you wonder what you would do if you were in Claire Bernal's shoes. This tragedy took place in Great Britain. A young woman named Claire Marie Bernal was born on July 25, 1983, in Groombridge, a village straight out of a fairy tale with sleepy green pastures and a blue ribbon of a river. Groombridge has a population of only about 1,600 people. It is just a two-hour train ride from London, so you can make a round trip in a single day. Claire's mother, Patricia Adams, whom everyone called Trisha, worked as a chef, and the girl's father, Martin, was a finance manager who conducted business in London. Claire was the oldest of three children, so she was responsible for her younger brothers. When the girl turned seven, her parents' relationship cracked, and they divorced. If the divorce of her father and mother played any role in Claire's life, she never showed it, always remaining positive and radiating optimism. Due to her age, the girl did not try to choose between her mom and dad and continued to maintain close relationships with both of them. The children stayed with their mother, and some of the responsibilities for raising the younger brothers fell on the shoulders of the eldest and only daughter. Claire was a quiet, calm child. In childhood, it took her a long time to open up. With each passing year, from an inconspicuous, shy girl, she turned into a pretty young woman, kind, trusting, and frank. Every morning, Claire watched her mother put on makeup, and by the age of 12, she was already experimenting with various types of cosmetics herself. Claire attended a Catholic secondary school and worked part-time at a local store to be able to finance her love for cosmetics. She enjoyed doing makeup for her mom and her girlfriends when they came over for sleepovers. That's when she began to come out of her shell because the opportunity to make others beautiful increased her own confidence. Claire was beautiful in soul. She saw only the good in people, not wanting to see their bad qualities. Her beautiful soul was clothed in outward attractiveness, which Claire herself often did not notice. When Claire turned 18, she had transformed into a stunning young woman with long, golden-brown hair, flawless skin, and a beautiful smile. By that time, she was a self-taught makeup artist, but the lack of knowledge still affected her professionalism. Claire decided that to move forward in her career, she needed to increase her level of knowledge. That is why the girl went to East Kent College, where she studied cosmetology for two years. In the future, Bernal dreamed of working on movie sets or in the theater, doing stage makeup. She practiced this every day in the studio. After receiving a diploma as a beauty consultant and theatrical makeup artist, in 2003, Claire began sending out emails with her resume to various department stores that had cosmetic departments, hoping to gain more practice. She crossed her fingers and sent applications to the most famous brands, not really hoping to be noticed. And then, at one of the top three shopping centers in London called Harvey Nichols, they noticed her resume and invited her for an interview. Claire carefully checked her portfolio and meticulously flipped through her college notebooks to refresh her knowledge. The girl was very nervous because this was her dream job. Friends, over 90% of viewers watch videos without subscribing to the channel. Check if you're subscribed. If not, please be so kind as to subscribe to the channel to support me. Harvey Nichols, a British chain of department stores, sold designer collections of clothing for men and women, fashionable accessories, cosmetic products, fine wines, and luxury food items. Of course, Claire did everything to get a position at this store, and she got it. Friends and family never doubted the girl for a second, unlike herself. In the fall, Claire moved to London and started working at one of the most famous department stores. On the first floor, there were dozens of showcases with skincare products, perfumes, and cosmetics. 
Along the walls stood displays dedicated to specific brands. Claire and three other employees were responsible for one of these displays, where premium cosmetics were sold. Wealthy female customers would come to them and sit in chairs. The employee's task was to select suitable shades and recommend skincare products, as well as skillfully apply makeup so that the clients would like it and want to purchase cosmetic products of that brand. Claire was very proud of her work and always looked the part, making sure her face was flawlessly made up, her posture was straight and her hair was carefully styled as the department's employees were walking advertisements for the products they offered. The girl's voice was melodic and her speech was well-spoken. She was simply made for this job. The department's employees worked in two shifts and spent their evenings attending parties and exploring London. Claire became very close with her colleagues. The girls were about the same age and their interests coincided in many ways. Claire, Susan, and Natalia rented an apartment together in a safe area, about a 40-minute train ride from the shopping center. It was a green zone, similar to the countryside. Claire felt at home. She was still very close to her mother, Tricia, who now lived in Tunbridge Wells with her new partner, Peter. She also periodically communicated with her father because now both her brothers lived with him. However, Claire did not manage to see her family and friends often, now her whole life was mainly focused on London and the shopping center where she worked. The girl liked the freedom that her profession as a beauty consultant provided her. She enjoyed hanging out with her new girlfriends, going on dates, and feeling her own attractiveness. As for long-term prospects in relationships with men, Claire was very picky. She was in no hurry to start serious romances. That was exactly the case until a handsome guy named Michael Petch appeared on the horizon. Michael got a job as a security guard at the department store in 2004, and Claire immediately took notice of him. The man had sparkling blue eyes and a kind of cute smirk. Apparently, the interested glances that the girl cast at the new security guard did not go unnoticed. At the end of January 2005, Michael approached and struck up a conversation with Claire in her beauty salon. He asked her out on a date and she was so flattered that she immediately called her mom and excitedly told her about the handsome man. Michael Petch, or Michal, a shy but very attentive man, was originally from Slovakia. He had served in the army for some time and, after working at the American embassy in Bratislava, came to London in 2003 on a student visa. While Michael was in the UK, Slovakia joined the European Union. This meant that he could now freely stay and work in this country. When Claire called her mother again, she said that she and Michael had already been on a date, drank coffee, had deep conversations about everything, and walked in the park. The girl shared that her new acquaintance had traveled a lot and was fun to talk to. The only thing she wasn't sure about was whether she wanted a serious relationship. This was also facilitated by the fact that Michael was nine years older than Claire and had recently gone through a divorce. At some point, Claire felt that the man had become much more infatuated with her than she had anticipated, and since then she had felt out of place. For her, he was nothing more than a nice friend, a companion with whom it was pleasant to spend time. She simply enjoyed walking together and was not inclined towards a long-term relationship. The girl always respected her mother's opinion, so when she showed Trisha a photo of Michael, she doubted whether this person was suitable for her daughter. The woman thought that he looked too mature for her, and there was something inexplicable in his eyes, as if he had been through a lot in his life. She did not categorically express her opinion, as she saw that Claire did not have serious feelings for him. And indeed, this little fling did not last long. Just three weeks after their first date, on February 28th, Claire broke off the relationship. Claire believed that before getting married or starting a serious romance, she needed to interact with different men and understand for herself what attracted her to people of the opposite sex, what she was really looking for in the long run. This is a fairly conscious approach of an adult, not to rush headlong into the pool, but to find out what you really want. In April 2005, Claire, Susan, and Natalia moved to another apartment. It was a multi-story brick building, and life there was picking up steam. In July, Claire turned 22. Her mother arranged a five-day trip to Florence, Italy for her, where they attended music festivals and took many photos. 
The pictures of the mother and daughter dancing, laughing, and just having a wonderful time together were supposed to be happy memories for years to come. Claire enjoyed learning about new cultures, and she even wanted to learn Italian. Trisha was so proud of her grown-up daughter and was very happy for her. That summer, Claire started dating a new guy, and this romance developed very rapidly. For the first time, the girl thought that she might want to see this person as her life partner. The relationship was gaining momentum quickly. The young couple spent a lot of time together, and they were happy. Usually, Claire worked in the morning, but on September 13, 2005, she agreed to swap shifts with one of her roommates. It was the most ordinary Tuesday. Claire was standing at her counter across from her colleague Victoria's counter, who worked with another cosmetic brand. There were already few customers in the department, and the employees just watched as shoppers left the mall with full bags. Around 7.45 p.m., Victoria waved to Claire and pointed to the clock, as if to say that there were only 15 minutes left until closing. At this time, several customers were strolling through the cosmetics department just looking at the displays. Another colleague, Helen, was also getting ready to close the store at this time. Victoria and Claire were just standing and smiling at each other, but literally within seconds, their smiles abruptly disappeared. Before anyone could understand what was happening in the mall, complete chaos broke out. People were running, there were screams and loud noises. Several witnesses called the emergency services and reported that a shooting had occurred in the building. A shooting in the department where Claire Bernal worked was unreal. It all happened very unexpectedly. The police who arrived at the scene were told that two people had probably died. The patrol officers relayed the information to the station and soon employees from the Serious Crimes Department arrived there. They were shocked that someone was able to enter the shopping center with a weapon. The victims were indeed two people, a man and a woman. It all happened at the cosmetics counter. The girl was lying face up, with a large red stain spreading around her on the ceramic tiles. It appeared that she had been shot in the head several times. Next to her lay a man with a bloodied face and arms outstretched to the side. There was a gun on the floor beside him, and shell casings were scattered around the body. It turned out that he had committed suicide by shooting himself in the right temple. The mall management explained to the detectives that this was Michael Petch, who had once worked as a security guard on the first floor. If anyone knew how to bring in a weapon, it was him. But why did Michael voluntarily leave this world? Was it a fit of jealousy? Was he mentally ill? How did he get access to a weapon? There were many questions, and the police had to sort it all out. The detectives learned that there had been a previous romantic relationship between the two deceased employees. That's when the officers found out that the second victim was Claire Bernal. The girl was not supposed to work that evening. Michael knew her schedule, as it almost never changed. And now the detectives wondered how the security guard found out that the girl would be working the evening shift. Claire's roommates told the officers that Michael was constantly hanging around the cosmetics counter. Claire had met him back in January, and they had only gone on three dates. The man seemed too intrusive to the girls. He demanded that Claire spend every day with him and refused to take no for an answer. According to the roommates, it was a very toxic relationship. So Claire didn't drag it out and broke up with the security guard, but he had no intention of leaving her alone. He called, sent text messages, constantly followed her, and acted as if they were still in a relationship. Michael constantly stalked the girl outside their apartment windows, so they decided to move to another area. But the harassment only intensified. He didn't want to leave Claire alone and confessed his love to her at every meeting. Claire no longer knew what to do because they had only gone on three dates, and she hadn't given him any reason to behave this way. The roommates explained to the police that Michael had been fired from the mall and was under investigation by the Metropolitan Police. In the summer, he stopped stalking Claire. The girls thought he was in jail and relaxed, but as it turned out, they were wrong. The investigators tracked down Michael's address and headed there. It was an apartment in an old building at the end of a street, a 40-minute drive from Claire's house, in a completely different, much more rundown area. The street was poorly lit, 
and the building itself was in terrible condition. It was surrounded by grass three feet high. All the windows were either boarded up or broken, but the front door was open. It was more like a homeless den than the residence of a decent person. In the house, the detectives found not one, not two, but seven men sleeping wherever they could. None of them were armed. All the inhabitants of the strange dwelling were from Eastern Europe and spoke little English. Only one was able to somehow tell the law enforcement officers about Michael Petch. The man explained that everyone who lived in this house had a visa. They were involved in construction projects and trade. Michael was their eighth roommate, and he had always been different from the majority. While others went out drinking, Petch sat alone in his bedroom, writing something in a notebook. But in general, he was a very sensitive and kind person until the beginning of March, and then he exploded with anger again. Michael had left them at the end of April, and they had no idea where he was at the moment. The inhabitants of the abandoned house were shocked when they learned that Petch had stooped to committing a crime. While some officers were conducting the investigation, others visited Claire's father, Martin. They informed him and the girl's brothers of the tragic news. Martin's heart instantly shattered into a thousand pieces. He had no idea that his daughter was dating anyone, and now he was angry at Trisha because she hadn't told him anything about Michael Petch. At 2.30 in the morning, the police visited Trisha's house. The woman had returned home around midnight, as she had been at a friend's birthday party. She was already asleep when there was a loud knock on the porch. Her partner, Peter, went to open the front door. While he was talking to law enforcement, Trisha listened to their every word. When Claire's name was mentioned, she realized that her worst nightmare had come true. The woman rushed downstairs and asked how it had happened. The police replied that the girl had been shot and Trisha already guessed who had done it. Time seemed to slow down for the mother. An endless number of emotions and questions raced through her head. She couldn't answer any of them. Trisha spent the rest of the night in complete shock. She was too upset to talk to anyone. Grief and guilt overwhelmed the woman's heart. The next morning, on Wednesday, September 14th, Detectives questioned the frightened colleagues and employees of the mall about what they had witnessed the previous evening. Everyone wanted to help. Everyone who knew Claire adored her. They couldn't believe that it had actually happened. The girls who worked with Claire told a similar story to the roommates. Claire had only gone on three dates with Michael before their relationship hit a dead end. The young couple had argued about something, and it was the man's fault. He came to the department to apologize and tried to win back Claire's affection, but she didn't want to have anything to do with him anymore. Nevertheless, Michael was persistent and crossed all boundaries. The girl had to turn to other mall employees for help. Michael was fired and banned from appearing in the store. Now it was time to talk to one of the last people who saw Claire alive. Victoria, who worked at the opposite counter, reported that Michael had shot Claire before she realized that she was in danger. Around 7.45 in the evening, before the end of the shift, the girls were glancing at each other. Suddenly, Victoria noticed a shadow behind Claire. It was a man, and he was sneaking up on her colleague like a spy. The girl thought that it was either a crazy customer trying to steal something, or Claire's new boyfriend wanting to surprise her. At that moment, the man emerged from the shadows. In his hand was a black gun aimed at the back of Claire's head. When Victoria realized what was happening, Claire was still smiling, but then there was a loud bang and she collapsed to the floor. Victoria stood there, unable to move. She was in complete shock. The man approached the fallen Claire and fired several more shots. Victoria saw nothing more because she ran, but she heard two more bangs behind her. The rest of the people in the store were also in a complete panic. Helen, the second colleague of the deceased, saw the first shot and immediately dove under the counter and covered her head. One witness thought the store was being robbed. Another thought there was some kind of accident at the mall and just ran out into the street. After the interrogations, it turned out that Michael first shot Claire in the back of the head and then three times in a row in the face. The fifth bullet accidentally hit the ceiling when the man tried to commit suicide. 
and the sixth and final one ended his life forever. The detectives found the hotel where Michael was staying at the time. In the room, they discovered a 40-page notebook where the man made his notes. He wrote in both English and Slovak. On one page, Michael wrote down Claire's new address, so the move didn't save the girls from being stalked. As it turned out, finding out the new address wasn't very difficult. Other pages of the notebook were filled with quotes about the meaning of life, about his love for Claire and Michael's own poems. He called the girl his one and only love. The entries showed how obsessed Michael was. He and Claire had actually only gone on three dates, and after the first one, the man realized that this girl was destined for him by fate, and they simply had to be together. It seemed that Michael lived in some kind of fantastic world of his own. He was absolutely not interested in anything except his feelings for his chosen one. Initially, Claire and Michael lay on adjacent tables in the pathologist's laboratory, and although someone might consider it silly, one of the officers decided that it was unethical to leave the girl next to her stalker and executioner and took Claire's gurney to another room. Claire's autopsy showed that she had been shot four times. The bullet to the back of the head instantly ended her life, so the three shots to the face were only meant to deprive her of her beauty. Michael wanted to take away everything that made the girl special. The results of Michael's autopsy showed a high level of a prohibited substance in his blood, a side effect of which is excessive aggression. It is now impossible to know whether Michael had deliberately taken this drug to give himself courage, or whether the crime was an accidental finale to an altered state of consciousness. A few days after the tragedy, the detectives spoke with Trisha, the mother of the deceased girl, to find out her version of events. The woman said that after three weeks of dating, Michael began to act like he owned Claire. He didn't want Claire to leave the house at all or communicate with anyone, even with her roommates or mother. Michael wanted to spend every spare hour with Claire, making the girl feel uncomfortable. Claire didn't want to hurt him, so she tried to soften the breakup. In fact, she was going to end communication even earlier. But Michael had planned a trip to his home in Slovakia at the end of February, and Claire didn't want to spoil his mood before the vacation. The last straw was when the man asked the girl to meet him at the airport upon his return. Then he began to insist on staying at her apartment and not dragging his heavy suitcase across London. When Claire asked him to leave, he refused. That's when Claire decided to tell him about the breakup, after which Michael sat outside her apartment for two hours. But this, according to Trisha, was only the beginning of his relentless stalking. The man began to follow the girl around the cosmetics department, watching her every move, and in the evenings he followed her all the way home or just stood guard at the entrance. He texted her 50 times a day, telling her that he loved her and repeating that they were made for each other. Then the messages became more disturbing. In them, Michael threatened to commit suicide if he couldn't be with Claire. Worse, Michael dragged his colleagues into all this, who would approach the girl during the day and try to persuade her to listen to the man in love. In their eyes, Claire clearly looked like a narcissistic bitch who was playing with the feelings of an adult. She felt the need to smooth over the situation, so she agreed to talk to Michael and explain that they could only be friends. But all this only aggravated the already strained relationship. After his shift, he followed her home with a large bouquet of flowers and persisted until she accepted it. In the end, the flowers lay on the porch of Claire's house for a week as she left them outside, refusing to accept any gifts from this individual. She probably berated herself for ever agreeing to go on a date with this man. Claire still hoped that Michael would grow tired of pursuing her and leave her alone. At the mall, she tried to keep her concerns about this matter private. The young woman didn't want to lose her dream job due to an admirer's intrusive behavior. The stalking began to affect Claire's emotional and physical well-being. She couldn't sleep, stopped eating properly, became anxious and cried over trivial matters. Work issues arose due to tardiness and scattered attention. Her world was literally shrinking. In March 2005, Claire spotted Michael on the subway platform as she was heading home. She quickly jumped on the train, but the man managed to board the same car. He sat opposite her and stared intently. At the stop, Claire ran again, but he caught up and shoved her. 
The threat to report him to the police only angered him further. Michael menaced that he would then take Claire's life. That evening, the young woman called her mother and tearfully recounted the threats from her former admirer. Both women were frightened at that moment but didn't believe he could seriously harm her, and they were wrong. Now the mother blamed herself for not intervening, not going to the police, not demanding protection for her daughter from Michael, and not saving her life. The next day, Michael was again standing at the cosmetics department window, tapping on the glass like a guilty puppy, waving his hand and publicly embarrassing Claire. He continued his phone attacks. Claire changed her number, but it didn't help. Michael somehow discovered it and continued calling and sending messages. When she blocked him, he changed his SIM card and started all over again. As soon as Michael's text messages began to include threats towards her, Claire finally mustered the courage to approach the mall's head of security, who took the accusations seriously. Using the store's cameras, he tracked the guard's behavior and transferred him to another floor. However, Michael still came to the beauty department to spy on Claire. Eventually, he was suspended from work entirely, and Claire was persuaded to go to the police, which she did. Michael was arrested, and Claire felt responsible for this. According to her mother, the girl didn't want to cause him trouble. She just wanted him to stop. Michael was released on bail under a non-molestation order aimed in English law at stopping harassment by a former partner. This meant he couldn't contact Claire, but Michael kept reappearing. The girl was terrified of the stalking because he wasn't causing physical harm, only emotional abuse. The police deemed him non-threatening. Michael was examined by a doctor who found no mental health issues. Nevertheless, the officers handling his case spoke with the mall's security service and Michael himself. The man, of course, told a completely different story of his relationship with Claire. According to him, he broke up with Claire to test her feelings. After this, the girl allegedly confessed she was in love with him, but his actions had hurt her. Now she was confused and didn't believe anything. When he realized he had made a mistake trying to find out how Claire felt about him, he begged for her forgiveness and tried to win her back. At the police station, this man swore he never wanted to cause pain to his beloved. He was sorry she was so upset because of him. When Michael once again violated the restraining order, he was arrested right outside Claire's new apartment. He raised his handcuffed wrists and smiled broadly. Eight days later, Michael was released on bail. His hearing was scheduled for late August. All this time, Claire dreaded facing Michael in court, feeling like an executioner. But this didn't happen because the lawyer convinced Michael to plead guilty to stalking to potentially receive only a six-month sentence, likely suspended. Michael was due to appear in court again on September 21, 2005, for sentencing. For several months between the arrest and trial, the persistent admirer didn't show up in Claire's sight, and the girl thought this nightmare had ended. She was relieved that she wouldn't be responsible for sending him to prison for several years, and six months in confinement would just show him that he had behaved incorrectly. No one expected Michael to violate his bail conditions. Detectives investigating Claire Bernal's death were able to determine the crime's motive and what preceded it but they still didn't know how Michael managed to acquire a gun and bring the weapon into the mall. After Michael was fired from Harvey Nichols, arrested twice, and released on bail, the police lost track of him. While on bail, Michael left the country for Slovakia in April 2005. In early May, he enrolled in a month-long target shooting course in his homeland, and on June 8th, he applied for a firearm permit with the Slovak police. This included a background check and a doctor's report. The check didn't reveal any criminal charges since Michael had not yet been convicted. After obtaining a firearms license, Michael officially purchased a compact pistol in July that was easy to conceal. Although he legally owned the weapon in Slovakia, it was prohibited in the UK. On August 11th, Michael boarded a bus back to London and hid the gun behind his back. Customs was supposed to check everyone passing through, but for some reason, Michael was never searched. He managed to smuggle the weapon and lay low until the court hearing on August 31st. All this time, he was planning an attack on Claire. 
Michael knew the girl's schedule and which side doors were unguarded during the day. And on September 13th, he carried out his sinister plan. Claire Bernal's funeral took place on September 26, 2005. Hundreds of people came to bid farewell to this young woman who died at the hands of a stalker. Her mother, Tricia, shared that her daughter wanted to advance in her profession, and she already had an interview scheduled for a secretary position at a PR company. Claire had begun moving her belongings to her father's house to feel safer and be closer to her new boyfriend, whom she was in love with and actually planned to marry. Her sudden passing devastated friends and relatives because none of them knew about the stalking. Claire disliked burdening others with her problems. The girl's mother, Trisha, somehow found the strength to channel her anger against Michael Petch into a successful campaign to make stalking a criminal offense. Together with families of other victims, she created an organization called Protection Against Stalking and lobbied authorities on this issue. In 2012, a new law prohibiting stalking was passed. Trisha's efforts to improve the effectiveness of the justice system earned her an honorary British Empire Award in 2021. Her work has helped many stalking victims, but unfortunately, it won't bring back the daughter whose voice she had to become to protect others. No one has the right to control another person's life. This is the end of the story. Like the video and leave your thoughts in the comments. This was Jeremy. See you soon. On December 31st, just an hour and a half before the new year, a woman called 911, reporting that her husband had been assaulted right on their home's driveway. Afterward, she tearfully phoned her father-in-law to inform him that his son had been critically injured. The Hassel family's New Year 2018 commenced with the news of the passing of their cherished loved one who succumbed to the wounds he had sustained. Camilla Martin was born on January 3, 1997, in Miami, Florida. A year later, her family relocated to Atlanta, Georgia, where she spent her childhood. Camilla grew up to be a very outgoing and energetic young woman, participating in track and field, performing as a cheerleader, and always being highly active. Her charisma attracted people, and she was constantly surrounded by friends. During her senior year in high school, she briefly contemplated whether to attend university or find a job. Ultimately, Kamiya chose to enlist in the military, which offered numerous benefits, including free health care, complementary education, and the opportunity to travel the world along with stability. After completing her studies, Kamiya joined the Army. In 2015, while stationed with a combat unit in Colorado, she met a young man named Tyrone Hassel III. He worked as a mechanical engineer and was also serving in the armed forces. From the very first moments of their interaction, the young couple realized they had a lot in common. They were both born into large families and shared a passion for sports. Attracted to each other, they decided to exchange phone numbers. This marked the beginning of their romance. Kamiya and Tyrone not only spoke on the phone regularly, but also spent a great deal of time together, quickly becoming inseparable. Their whirlwind romance naturally evolved into a serious relationship. Sometime later, Camilla discovered she was pregnant. Tyrone was thrilled, especially when he learned they were expecting a boy. He made the responsible decision to ask for Camilla's hand in marriage. Tyrone's father, noticing the rapid progression of their romance, asked his son if he had carefully considered and thought everything through given that they had only recently started dating. Confident in his feelings, Tyrone assured his father that he was truly in love with Camilla and wanted to marry her. He eagerly anticipated the opportunity to create his own little family and pass on his surname to his future son. Friends, over 90% of viewers watch videos without subscribing to the channel. Check if you're subscribed. If not, please be so kind as to subscribe to the channel to support me. Having received consent for marriage, the newlyweds settled into Tyrone's father's house and began preparing for the arrival of their firstborn. They lovingly set up the baby's nursery and discussed plans for the future. It was an exciting time for both of them. Unfortunately, one of the drawbacks of military service is frequent relocations. The newly married couple received orders to transfer to the state of Georgia. 
When they learned about this, they simply tried to make the most of their situation. And although Camille was disappointed with the move, there was a positive aspect. She would now be closer to her family, who still resided in Georgia. The birth of their first child in early 2017 made the husband focus all his efforts on raising the baby and fully accept the situation. It was a healthy, strong baby boy whom they named Tyrone Hassel IV, or Chunk. The daily care of their son took up almost all of their free time. The marriage and birth of the child happened so quickly that the newlyweds didn't even have time to fully enjoy each other's company. Additionally, a month later, Tyrone informed Camilla that he had invited his teenage brother to live with them for a while. The reason was that the neighborhood where his family lived could not be called safe. Tyrone was worried that his younger brother would get involved with the wrong crowd and run into trouble. Staying with them in Georgia would help the teenager avoid the dangerous environment and benefit him. As an older brother, Tyrone felt responsible for him. Camilla was not at all thrilled with this idea. They had just gotten married, recently had a baby, and had no time to truly settle into their roles as husband and wife. Now there would be another person in their home, essentially a complete stranger to her. But Tyrone didn't really give her a choice. He had already made the decision, so his brother moved in, and the young wife had to adapt to his presence somehow. However, Tyrone, who had just turned 22, felt great. In his short military career, he had already been promoted to the rank of sergeant, which was a significant achievement for him. He was proud and happy that he could provide financial security for his family. Overall, things were going well, but as soon as the couple got used to their new living conditions, everything changed again. Immediately after their son's first birthday, both Camilla and Tyrone received orders to go to South Korea for military service. The teenage brother returned to his parents in Michigan. Little Chunk was left in the care of his grandparents, while Kamaya and Tyrone headed to South Korea for a military operation. Despite being married, the young couple served in different locations and lived in separate barracks, so they didn't see each other as often as before. But in reality, they didn't make much effort to spend a lot of time together. However, there was one person Kamiya saw regularly, another soldier named Jeremy Quellar from Chicago, Illinois. The two had met earlier, before they ended up in South Korea, but they weren't particularly close friends. Now, serving side by side, they began to develop an affinity for each other. Jeremy was a couple of years older than Kamiya and was also married. When he received his deployment to South Korea, he was already in the process of getting divorced. The two fellow soldiers bonded over frequently discussing their personal lives and expressing grievances about their partners. Camilla was unhappy in her marriage and claimed that Tyrone didn't give her enough attention. She asserted that her workaholic husband spent more time on the military base than at home with her and their son. Their communication continued after work on Snapchat. Eventually, this correspondence began to take on an increasingly playful tone and smoothly evolved into flirting, which later shifted into real life. Kamiya was a driver and often gave Jeremy rides for personal errands, and he, in turn, filled up her car with gas and invited her to dinner as a gesture of gratitude. The young woman was struck by the attention she received from Jeremy and started comparing him to her husband. The advantage clearly did not favor Tyrone, who was always busy with his service. Compared to her spouse, the new boyfriend appeared much more romantic and interested in spending time together and communicating. The relationship between Jeremy and Kamiya developed very rapidly. Friendly trips to the gym, joint hangouts, and visits to bars after work soon turned into a full-fledged affair. Jeremy not only showered his girlfriend with exquisite compliments, but also often bought her small gifts. He said that she deserved much more than what she was getting from her husband, Tyrone. As the two grew closer to each other, they could no longer hide their affair from their fellow soldiers. Their irresistible attraction became evident not only to their colleagues, but also to people who saw them in bars and at the gym. Those around them began to whisper, knowing that Kamiya was married to Sergeant Tyrone and that Jeremy had a wife at home. Some even tried to pull Kamiya aside and warn her that her secret affair was noticeable to everyone around. However, 
the love-struck Camilla was hardly concerned about the fact that this information would sooner or later reach her husband. And that's exactly what happened. Ignoring numerous warnings, she continued to flirt with her lover during training at the gym and was spotted by a close friend of Tyrone's. The man immediately understood the nature of the relationship between the two fellow soldiers and promptly told Tyrone everything. The couple had a serious conversation, where the woman categorically denied having an affair with Jeremy and promised to cease all communication with him. In reality, Kamiya did nothing of the sort. She continued to meet and communicate with Jeremy until one day, when they were together, her husband noticed that his wife was texting her lover on Snapchat. At that moment, a loud argument erupted. The man expressed all his grievances towards his wife, to which she solemnly promised never to talk to or flirt with Jeremy again. Although, in fact, she simply warned Jeremy that they should be more careful not to arouse suspicion from her husband. By that point, they had both completely disregarded Tyrone's feelings and continued their full-fledged relationship. Jeremy finally finalized his divorce and told Camilla that he was ready to take her husband's place and become a father to her son, Chunk. He also made it clear that he was prepared to get rid of Tyrone one way or another. It was now up to her to file for divorce. Around the same time, the couple was in the process of updating their life insurance policies. Camilla and Tyrone were each other's beneficiaries and were insured for $400,000. They would not be entitled to this money if they separated. In a conversation with her lover, the woman inquired about what Jeremy would do if he had $400,000 right now. They spent the whole day fantasizing about how they would spend the money until Kamiya directly asked if Jeremy was ready to send Tyrone to the other side so that they could have the opportunity to make their fantasies a reality. The love-struck Jeremy confessed that he was ready to do anything for his beloved woman. That's why their conversation further flowed into planning an actual crime. Jeremy, unable to contain his overflowing emotions, shared this plan with his friend. He enthusiastically talked about how the $400,000 would provide him, Camilla, and Little Chunk with a great start to their future life together. The friend, of course, did not believe that Jeremy was serious, because his words about killing his mistress's husband sounded too crazy. Unfortunately, the unfaithful spouses had no doubts about their own righteousness and the luck that accompanied them. Over the next few months, Camilla constantly complained to Jeremy about Tyrone, saying that she was very unhappy with his behavior, that her husband was driving her crazy, and that she couldn't wait to find herself in the strong arms of her beloved Jeremy. All these complaints really fueled the man's desire to save Camilla from the terrible relationship and find a way out of the toxic situation. In addition to everything, the woman sent Jeremy photos of Little Chunk and wrote that she could already imagine the boy calling Jeremy dad. Camilla described how they would live as one happy family and raise her son together. Having conceived of getting rid of her annoying husband, the woman deliberately portrayed the unbearable nature of the situation in messages to her lover, which allegedly caused her great emotional pain. The naive Jeremy believed Camilla's every word and constantly assured her that it was only a matter of time. Soon everything would be over, and her life would change for the better. He promised to take care of it, and for now, he asked her to pull herself together and endure a little until the right moment came to implement their plans. As the Christmas and New Year holidays were approaching, Camilla and Jeremy decided that it would be the perfect time to eliminate Tyrone. The Hassels intended to spend Thanksgiving in Georgia with Camilla's family and then go to Michigan to spend Christmas with Tyrone's family. Meanwhile, Jeremy was supposed to go home to Chicago to spend his vacation with his mother. And since the lovers would be close to each other, Jeremy would be able to get to Michigan to carry out their sinister plan. Everything was supposed to look as if Tyrone had become a victim of street violence. He simply found himself in the wrong place at the wrong time. It wouldn't raise suspicions, considering the neighborhood where the Hassels lived. The city was known for its high crime rate. In October 2018, the nine-month stay in South Korea ended. All three returned to the United States for leave. Tyrone and Camilla were reunited with their beautiful boy. 
The woman pretended that everything was fine while secretly counting down the days until her husband's demise. Jeremy was also counting down the days until he could embrace his beloved without fear of incurring her husband's wrath. He had already purchased a couple of guns from a fellow soldier. He and Camilla communicated only through Snapchat, where the mistress continued to send photos and videos of Chunk, calling him Jeremy's son. December 17, 2018 arrived. The Hassles went to Michigan, where they planned to stay for 10 days at Tyrone's father's house. As soon as they arrived there, Camilla learned that nothing had changed. Another of her husband's relatives, this time his younger sister, was going to move into their home in Georgia. The girl planned to go with them when their vacation ended. Kamiya was furious. Although Tyrone's fate was already sealed, the fact that he had once again made a decision without her threw the woman off balance. She immediately contacted Jeremy and, very upset, expressed her grievances against her husband, trying to further justify her decision to get rid of Tyrone. Kamiya claimed that this was a display of extreme disrespect towards her and a lack of concern for their child's well-being. That day, Jeremy was once again convinced that his beloved was suffering and promised her that he would soon rid her of all her problems. However, the 10-day trip to Tyrone's father's house was coming to an end, and Jeremy still hadn't shown up and fulfilled his promise. Camilla began to panic, so she decided to increase the pressure on her lover, demanding the immediate implementation of their plan. To buy more time, she suggested to her husband that they stay with his family for a few more days, maybe even celebrate New Year's with them, since the grandparents saw so little of Chunk, and it would be fun for them to celebrate the holidays together. In reality, Kamiya was just trying to give her lover more time to get to Michigan and carry out their plan. The unsuspecting Tyrone gladly agreed. He didn't need to be persuaded to stay with his parents a little longer. He met up with friends, had fun, and helped the family prepare for the new year. Jeremy promised Kamaya that he would execute the plan within seven days. On December 28th, he went to a supermarket to buy a GPS navigator for the dashboard. Then he sent a message to his mistress on Snapchat, reassuring her that he was already on his way. After that, he turned off his phone before leaving Chicago to avoid tracking his location. But instead of buying another mobile with an unknown number for cover, he turned his phone back on to ask Kamiya for a meeting. He needed to see her before committing a crime for her sake. However, the woman refused a date, arguing that now was not the time for romance. They needed to focus on the reason he was here. She pointed out several locations to Jeremy, where her husband would be over the next four days, hoping that her lover would be able to choose a suitable place for the murder. On the first evening when Tyrone was out with his friends at a nightclub, Jeremy followed him. He watched his rival exit the establishment, then sat across the street from the nearest gas station, observing as Tyrone filled up his car. But Jeremy lost his nerve and couldn't pull the trigger that night. About two days later, Jeremy mustered up the courage to take a person's life. Kemia gave him the address of Tyrone's father's house. The perpetrator positioned himself in his car on the opposite side of the street, waiting for the right moment. He saw Tyrone leave the house, but he wasn't alone. His teenage brother was walking with him. Jeremy hesitated. He contacted Kemia and explained that he couldn't shoot now because Tyrone's younger brother was with him, to which his accomplice ordered him to shoot both of them. The teenager had annoyed her when he lived with them in the house. However, for the first time, Jeremy stood firm and said he wasn't going to do it. The next attempt failed again because Tyrone was walking too quickly. Jeremy was either confused or, more likely, simply lost his nerve. There were a total of six unsuccessful attempts. Kemia was angry and beside herself. She wrote to her lover on Snapchat, genuinely outraged. The vacation time was relentlessly running out and her husband was alive and well. After each fruitless attempt, Jeremy would drive back to Chicago to try again the next day to carry out the plan. After a harsh conversation with Kemia, he once more promised her that this time he would definitely keep his word. The last day of the year arrived. The Hassels had planned to have a picnic in a meadow a five-minute walk from the house. They wanted to celebrate New Year's Eve outdoors with friends. The day before, 
Kemia pretended to be sick. She told her husband that she was feeling unwell and would prefer to just stay at his father's house. The wife told Tyrone that she would also leave their son at home so the adults could relax and enjoy themselves without having to watch over a small child. When everyone had left, Kemia called her lover and gave him one more chance to give her freedom. Jeremy tried once again to set up a date before going through with the deed, but was rejected once more. Kemia claimed that she was babysitting and couldn't meet up. That day, Tyrone set himself up. Around 10 p.m., he called his wife and told her that he would stop by the house for a minute to bring her some treats. The woman realized that this was the perfect time for the crime. She hastily texted Jeremy, inviting him to take a convenient position somewhere near the house. She prepared to wait, restless with excitement. After all, if her lover lost his nerve now, she and her husband would return home to Georgia, and she would have to continue playing the role of an exemplary wife. Determined, Jeremy quickly reached the desired street and parked in the driveway of a vacant house. He took the gun in his hands and hid near the Hassel's residence. Around 10.30 p.m., Tyrone's car pulled into the driveway. The man grabbed a bag of food and disappeared through the front door. Now or never, the perpetrator mentally urged himself. He had already replayed the scene in his mind several times, imagining himself confronting Kemia's husband, shooting, hitting the heart on the first attempt, and inconspicuously leaving the scene. But it all turned out to be not so easy and simple. As soon as Tyrone exited the house and headed towards the car to celebrate New Year's Eve with his parents and friends, Jeremy leaped out of the ambush and shot Tyrone at point-blank range. The bullet reached its target and Tyrone fell to the ground. This emboldened the criminal. He approached closer and fired a few more shots, just to make sure his rival wasn't breathing. Then Jeremy swiftly ran towards the vacant house where his car was waiting. He didn't remember how he got behind the wheel. Slamming on the gas pedal, he sped away from that horrific place as quickly as possible. He raced down the highway at a wild speed all the way to Chicago, tossing the weapon out the window along the way. Meanwhile, it was Kemia's turn to play her role as a terrified wife. Screaming, she ran out into the street, portraying a shocked and crazed spouse. She hysterically cried for help, hoping to attract the attention of neighbors or passers-by. Then she ran back into the house to call 911. While the operator was asking for the address and additional information, she seemingly accidentally hung up, realizing that despite the severity of the wound, Tyrone was still alive. She then dialed her father-in-law's number and asked him to return home immediately as his son had just been attacked and wounded. Meanwhile, the dispatcher managed to determine the location of the incident by the number and dispatched an ambulance there. The police arrived at the Hassel's house right after the paramedics. At this moment, Kemia continued to play the role of a concerned wife, and it looked quite believable. When Tyrone was being loaded into the vehicle, the woman tried with all her might to get to him. The police had to literally physically drag her away. Unfortunately, Tyrone did not survive. He died from his injuries. When his family was informed of this news, Kemia didn't miss a second of her performance as a grief-stricken widow. But as soon as she was alone with her phone, she immediately dialed Jeremy's number to confirm that he had finally done it. After receiving confirmation that the goal had been achieved, Jeremy headed to Georgia to quickly gather his belongings. In his mind, he had already reunited with Kemia, taken Tyrone's place, and was enjoying the happy moment they had worked so long to reach. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you like this video. It's really important. Meanwhile, the Hassel family and the police worked tirelessly to determine who had orchestrated the attack on Tyrone. Detectives spoke with countless neighbors and Kemia, who all insisted they hadn't seen anything at all. The widow repeatedly told the police that she had no idea who could have targeted her husband. Investigators examined the crime scene in search of any clues that may have been left by the perpetrator. The only thing they found was a muddy footprint on the driveway. It had rained earlier that day. Then another lead emerged. An elderly couple living next door to the Hassels had seen a strange car. The vehicle had backed into the driveway of a vacant house. This building was up for sale, so it was unlikely that any potential buyers had come to view the residence at such a time, 
an hour and a half before New Year's. This seemed suspicious to them, which the retirees reported to the police who questioned them. They also saw an unknown man run to this car shortly after the shots were fired, and the muddy footprint led in that direction. The initial theory was an unsuccessful robbery, but nothing had been taken from Tyrone. His keys were on the ground, his wallet in his pocket, as was his phone. So this theory was quickly ruled out. Intentional homicide most likely indicated some personal motive. But here, too, the detectives were met with disappointment. Tyrone was one of those people who had no enemies. He was a good guy, and those around him thought highly of him. So the case hit a dead end almost immediately. During the investigation, Kemia began to completely ignore Jeremy. When he started bombarding her with messages, she merely told him that she felt bad and missed her husband terribly. This was confusing. And then, the woman decided to delete the messaging app altogether. She still remained in Tyrone's father's house along with his entire family, playing the role of a grieving wife. Kemia turned 22 the day after receiving the autopsy results. Instead of celebrating, she held a candlelight vigil in honor of her late husband. She constantly posted tearful posts on social media about how much she missed her spouse, shared photos and memories, and expressed sadness that her son had been deprived of a father. Chunk's second birthday was approaching, and now Tyrone was not there to celebrate this event with his family. The military's vacation was ending, and everyone had to return to base. Everyone except Kemia, who had been granted additional days by management due to the tragedy. The woman was still staying with Tyrone's father. Her mother and sister came to support her in this difficult time. They all believed that Kemia was having a very hard time coping with the loss and couldn't come to terms with it. Tyrone's father was overly protective of her, wanting her and his grandson to be close by so he could keep an eye on them just in case. Who knows, maybe the perpetrator had decided to wipe out the entire Hassel family. Meanwhile, Jeremy was beside himself. He had already taken a desperate step just for the sake of his beloved, and now he had completely lost contact with her. Not knowing who to turn to for advice, he told his friend in detail about what he had done, about how he had followed Tyrone but simply couldn't bring himself to pull the trigger, and then on New Year's Eve, he finally mustered up the courage to do it, and now he himself didn't know how to live on. The friend, not knowing what to do in such a situation, went to the chapel to talk to the chaplain. He confessed that he was at a loss as to what to do, to which the chaplain urged him to do the right thing and go to the police, which the friend eventually did. A few days later, on January 19th, 2019, detectives received another tip, this time from a young woman, Jeremy's ex-girlfriend. She believed that Kemia and Jeremy were behind what had happened to Tyrone. When investigators got to the military base in Georgia, they personally spoke not only with Jeremy's friend and ex-girlfriend, but also with other soldiers who confirmed the overly close and inappropriate relationship between the two lovers. Detectives obtained a warrant to search Jeremy's apartment in Georgia, as well as his mother's home in Chicago. They didn't find any weapons, but they did find documents for the purchase of two pistols, one of which matched the caliber that had taken Tyrone's life. Requestioning Kemia yielded results. The widow quickly realized what was happening, so she significantly downplayed her relationship with Jeremy. She said there was no close relationship between them, only a light flirtation. To back up her words, the widow even agreed to take a polygraph test, but failed miserably. When Kemia was told that her lover had been arrested and that he had already begun testifying against her, the woman became frightened and started telling what had really happened. At the same time, she portrayed Jeremy as a stalker obsessed with the idea of getting her for himself. He had come to Michigan of his own volition, following her and her husband everywhere, but eventually, already around three in the morning, she gave up and admitted that she and Jeremy had jointly planned the attack on her husband. Kemia was detained and charged. Detectives lied that Jeremy had been arrested. They only came for him a few days later. Unlike his mistress, he refused to speak without a lawyer present. When the Hassel family learned who was responsible for Tyrone's death, they were in shock. Most disgusting to them was the fact that Kemia had played the role of a grieving wife so well and had stayed in their home until the very end. 
They had taken care of her in every way and tried to support her at a time when they themselves were genuinely mourning. It took authorities seven months to build a case against Camilla Hassel, as all communication between her and Jeremy was conducted on Snapchat and the woman had deleted the app from her phone. Detectives were unable to recover these records. However, they did have the woman's search history, betraying her own husband. Kemia had Googled whether police could retrieve Snapchat messages after deleting an account. This was possible within a 30-day period, so the widow deliberately stopped communicating with Jeremy through the app. In addition, prosecutors had no physical evidence linking Kemia to her husband's death. Fortunately for the prosecution, she made a fatal mistake by admitting what she had done during a phone call from jail with her mother. Kemia said that she and Jeremy had planned the crime together, but most of the responsibility lay with him, as he was the one who had forced her to do it. When her mother asked why she hadn't just broken up with her husband, Camilla stated that she was afraid of disappointing her with her failed marriage. But her mother was more disappointed by what she had done. After speaking with her daughter, the woman expressed strong remorse to Tyrone's family because they had lost their son because of Kemia. Kemia and Jeremy were tried separately. The widow's lawyers insisted that the detectives had forced their client to make a confession by deceiving her that Jeremy had testified. Moreover, the interrogation lasted well past midnight when Kemia was so tired that she said too much against herself. They then questioned the reliability of the polygraph test, stating that these tests are unreliable and can give false results. However, the phone call made by Kemia to her mother destroyed the entire line of defense. The jury deliberated for a very short time before reaching a verdict. Finding Kemia guilty of conspiracy to commit a crime, as well as intentional infliction of grievous bodily harm in the first degree. She was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. The defendant showed no remorse when her sentence was announced. Jeremy, unlike his mistress, repented and fully admitted his guilt. He couldn't hold back tears when Tyrone's loved ones spoke in court. Jeremy also admitted that he was in love and was ready to do anything for Kemia and her son that she asked him to do. Jeremy was sentenced to 65 to 90 years in prison with the possibility of parole. As he was being led out of the courtroom, he shouted to Tyrone's father that he wanted to tell him something. The man who had lost his son because of Jeremy visited him in prison once to listen. During an hour-long conversation, Jeremy told Tyrone's father the honest truth about everything, from the moment he met Kemia to the tragic end. He felt that the family deserved to know the real truth because their daughter-in-law probably hadn't told them. Kemia and Jeremy were dishonorably discharged from the armed forces after their convictions. And in 2021, Kemia tried to appeal her verdict, claiming that her lawyer was incompetent and that she was a victim of battered woman syndrome. But the court rejected her appeal. Tyrone and Kemia's son Chunk went to live with her mother. He communicates with his grandparents on his father's side, mostly by video. Unfortunately, after the tragedy, the relationship between the two families became very awkward. The saddest thing about this story is that little Chunk will never know what his father was like. 23-year-old Army Sergeant Tyrone Hassel III. This is the end of the story. Like the video and leave your thoughts in the comments. This was Jeremy. See you soon. Evil wears many masks and the most dangerous is the mask of virtue. The power of evil lies in its ability to conceal itself. Gina had the potential to become a famous movie star in the future, but fate had different plans. One day, the young woman simply vanished without a trace. She disappeared just a few feet away from reaching her home. In the summer of 2006, 14-year-old Georgina Kruger relocated with her family to Stendelstrasse in Berlin. The girl's parents had divorced a couple of years earlier. Her mother's name was Vesna, and her younger sister was Michelle. Georgina also had an older brother named Tommy, who was 22 at the time and lived separately. Being new to the class, Gina, as she was more often called at home, had virtually no friends. Her female classmates disliked the fact that Gina's arrival caused a stir among the boys, although Gina herself was unaware of how many teenagers found her attractive. 
suddenly becoming popular among the male half of the class, the girl provoked a negative reaction from the girls. They were simply jealous of her and were in no hurry to accept her into their group. In reality, Georgina paid a lot of attention to her appearance. She always dressed fashionably, enjoyed wearing makeup, and took care of herself. She dreamed of becoming an actress, but also considered modeling. Gina often danced in front of the mirror, tried out different looks, and imagined herself in the spotlight on a big stage. The girl adored Indian films the most. While watching the actors on the TV screen, she mimicked their movements and tried to sing along with them. On Friday, September 22, 2006, her dream was supposed to come true because Georgina received an offer to play a small role in the film Turkish for Beginners. They promised to call her after the weekend. On Monday, September 25th, the casting agency was supposed to contact the schoolgirl to inform her of their decision. The filming was scheduled for the next autumn holidays. Gina had everything planned out and was eagerly awaiting the start of the week to answer the call and receive the coveted agreement for a small role in the project. It was what she had long dreamed of. Saturday and Sunday seemed endless to the girl. On Monday, September 25, 2006, Gina somehow sat through her lessons and rushed home after school. She would not miss the call from the agency for anything, but unfortunately, things did not go at all as the high school student expected. Friends, over 90% of viewers watch videos without subscribing to the channel. Check if you're subscribed. If not, please be so kind as to subscribe to the channel to support me. After leaving school, Georgina, as usual, hurried to the public transport stop, boarded the Hash 27 bus, and headed home. She needed to ride for a few stops and then walk just 600 feet to find herself in front of the front door. Around 2 o'clock in the afternoon, the high school student was seen getting off the bus. Her grandmother and younger sister Michelle were at home. They had already prepared lunch. They were just waiting for Gina to sit down at the table together. But the girl never arrived home. At two o'clock, the grandmother tried to contact her granddaughter on her mobile phone, but she didn't answer. The woman was worried. Anything could have happened. Perhaps Gina missed the bus or met someone she knew and got caught up in conversation. In any case, she should have appeared any minute. However, time passed, and the schoolgirl still wasn't there. The grandmother tried to dial her granddaughter's number again to hurry her up, but the call immediately went to voicemail. Then the woman decided to call the school to find out if anything unusual had happened. Maybe Georgina had skipped classes altogether. The school reassured her and said that the girl had attended all the lessons and had gone home after they ended. The teacher noticed that Gina had been a little distracted that day, but her grandmother knew the reason. Her granddaughter was waiting for a call from the casting agency and could not believe her own luck. The elderly woman began to worry more and more with each passing hour. She waited until Georgina's mother came home and told her what had happened. Vesna immediately had a bad feeling. Such behavior was uncharacteristic of her eldest daughter. Gina was always punctual, kept her agreements, and would never have been so late without notifying her loved ones. Moreover, she would never have turned off her mobile phone. The women immediately dialed the police station and reported the schoolgirl's disappearance. At first, the officers went through all the possible scenarios. Could Kruger have run away from home? Was there a serious quarrel with family or friends? Was Gina dating a boy? And could she have done something foolish due to teenage love? Or maybe there was some conflict at school, and the upset girl was just hiding somewhere. But it was important to remember that on that day, Gina was supposed to receive a call from the agency about her role in the film Turkish for Beginners, and she would not have missed that call for anything in the world, considering that she had been talking about it all weekend. The police recorded what the girl was wearing when she was last seen and compiled a description. Georgina was approximately 5 feet 5 inches tall, had long straight hair, and was dressed in light blue jeans with scuffs, brown-heeled ankle boots, and a white denim jacket. She had a long strapped pink school bag with her and a mobile phone, which was later found to be turned off. Detectives traced the location of the schoolgirl's cell phone through cell towers and discovered that at 2.06 p.m., 
the device was pinged on Stendelstrasse, and at 2.08 p.m., it was already switched off. It was unlikely that Georgina, being practically at home at some point, decided to turn around, especially since she was expecting a very important call from the agency that day about the role. She was seen getting off bus hash 27, which definitely proved that the girl was very close to home, at least within a few minutes' walk. A large search operation was launched on the street where the Kruger family lived. All nearby attics and basements were checked. The police even used dogs trained to detect human remains. Investigators questioned local residents and Gina's classmates. They checked several dozen criminals who were out on bail or had recently been released from prison. The Kruger family handed out leaflets with a photograph of the schoolgirl. Posters with a description of the missing girl were also posted throughout the district. Vesna herself went around to the neighbors and tried to find out any information about her daughter. However, all the efforts of the investigators and the family did not move the case forward and did not yield any results. Georgina seemed to have vanished into thin air just 300 feet from her home. Weeks and months passed, and three years after the girl disappeared in broad daylight, a second search operation was organized. This time, the police again used search dogs capable of finding not only human remains, but also living people. The service dogs began their search from the bus stop, but they led the investigators not to the Kruger's house, but to the suburbs. The police searched the wooded area, but found no evidence that the girl had ever been there, which was not surprising since hoping that the dogs would pick up a scent after three years was pointless. The repeated search operation also did not provide any leads in the case. It did not move forward. There was a feeling that they were looking for a needle in a haystack, but this was not a needle but a real teenage girl, and she could not have vanished without a trace. Many years later, in 2016, another search was conducted. It seemed that it would yield at least some results. The residents of Stendelstrasse, where the Kruger family lived, were checked and questioned again, and there was a small breakthrough in the case. According to neighbors, a 30-year-old unemployed man lived in their area. He could stand on the porch for hours, Looking at passing teenagers, he clearly enjoyed watching them. The man was often seen chatting with young girls, the same age as the missing Gina. Sometimes he would say all sorts of obscenities to them and ask provocative questions, like whether they had ever slept with boys. At the same time, he hinted that he could help them figure out this intimate issue. To win over the high school girls, he often understated his age and tried to appear younger than he actually was. The schoolgirls were not afraid of him but tried to avoid him, considering him strange and very intrusive. It was this strangeness that made the neighbors pay attention to him. So who was this person? The man living next door to the Kruger family was named Ali Ka. He was the father of three children and lived with them and his wife Melek in an apartment at Three Stendelstrasse. Ali, who grew up in the Middle East, was unemployed and stayed afloat by taking odd jobs and receiving social benefits. He had a lot of debts and constantly had problems with money because he lived beyond his means. His passion, apart from young girls, was expensive and fashionable cars, which he could only dream of. In his free time, the man often visited a Turkish cafe located on the first floor of his apartment building. There he met with friends and acquaintances, although in reality, Ali had no close friends. For the most part, he communicated with random people who happened to be nearby. The investigators paid attention not only to the neighbor's testimony about the man's strange behavior, but also to his previous criminal record. In 2011, he committed a violent crime by luring a 17-year-old neighbor into his basement. The girl, after walking with her friend, went home, and Ali was standing on the porch of house number three, he called out to the schoolgirl and offered to buy her a mobile phone. The high school student was interested in the lucrative offer. After hesitating and being persuaded, she followed Ali into the basement, where the gadget supposedly lay. Naturally, there was no phone there. Instead, Ali said that he had been in love with the girl for a long time and was even ready to leave his wife just to be with her. After the confession, the man tried to kiss her, but the schoolgirl sharply refused for which she received a blow to the back of the head. When her exhausted body slid down, Ali sat on top of her. 
Despite attempts to scream and resist, the girl could not resist the adult man. When it was over, Allie stood up and handed the captive a handkerchief to wipe away her tears. The rapist threatened her to keep her mouth shut and not dare to tell anyone what had happened, not her family, friends, or especially the police. The girl nodded obediently, but in reality, she was just waiting for the moment when she would escape from the basement. Once outside, she went straight to the police station and told everything, pointing her finger at Allie. The high school student also described the basement room in great detail and named some details confirming the authenticity of the story. According to her, it was more like a small room where the owner spent his free time than a storeroom with unnecessary things. Ali was charged with assaulting a 17-year-old girl. In 2012, he received a year and a half probation for abusing a minor combined with bodily harm. According to the accused, the girl herself asked him to use a mobile phone. When he went to the basement, she followed him. After examining the gadget, the high school student stated that she had no money with her, but she could pay in another way, to which Ali categorically refused, as he had a family and his own children. He would never have risked the well-being of his loved ones. Apparently, this did not stop the girl, and she tried to hug the man, for which she received a slap on the back of the head. The humiliated and angry schoolgirl began to shout that she would ruin Ali's family by telling his wife and children everything. She could not calm down and was showering him with threats, promising to ruin his life. It even seemed to the man that the girl had some kind of harmful addiction because her mood changed too quickly. Ali's family fully supported him and assured that the schoolgirl had long shown interest in an adult man and had repeatedly tried to flirt with him. After he rejected her, she decided to take revenge in this way, claiming that he had forced her to have sexual intercourse. This whole story with the 17-year-old girl largely coincided with the situation of Georgina. The schoolgirl was also returning home after classes and disappeared in the same area where Ali had attacked another high school student. According to the mobile phone data, Gina disappeared in the area between the bus stop and her house number 8 on Stendelstrasse. Ali also lived there in house number three. The girl would have had to pass by his front door in any case. Could this person have somehow intercepted the schoolgirl? The problem was that the search dogs showed no interest in the basement of Ali's house. The detectives had no specific evidence, no witness statements, no DNA, nothing that could be presented to the suspect. The only coincidence was that on the day of the disappearance, Georgina and Ali's mobile phones were pinged in the same area. This could indicate that they were together, but it could also mean that they simply lived on the same street. And that's all. Interrogating the man would also be pointless. If the police have nothing to present, he will simply say that he had nothing to do with Gina's disappearance. The authorities decided to apply a rather unusual strategy. To begin with, they simply monitored Ali's phone calls. The surveillance continued for several weeks. Investigators learned that the man had money problems. He was gambling and owed a fairly large sum, at least 10,000 euros. The police decided to play on this. They were facing a long-term and very costly operation to introduce agents into the close circle of the suspect's family. They simply had no other options to get closer to the case of the missing girl. An undercover police officer named Hokan was sent on the case. This was his code name. He was supposed to enter the circle of Ali's trusted people to try to find out information about the disappearance of Georgina Kruger. The undercover agent was supposed to appear before the suspect in the role of a successful businessman who had come to Berlin to open a car wash. He appeared in the cafe located on the first floor of the apartment building where Ali lived and managed to establish contact with the suspect. It was assumed that the operation would be quite lengthy in order not to arouse any suspicion on Ali's part. Hokan became acquainted with the regulars of the Turkish cafe and told them the story of his car wash business, which he planned to open in the area. He needed a manager with a good salary. Ali, who had no way to pay off his accumulated debts, became interested in the opening prospects. Soon, he and Hakan became inseparable, once they traveled together on business to Frankfurt. Thanks to this trip, the men began to trust each other even more. Ali already really imagined how his life would change after getting a job at the car wash as a manager. 
he and Hokan began to meet in private as well. However, Ali was in no hurry to share his sins with his new friend. On the contrary, he wanted to appear in the eyes of the businessman as a decent and worthy person so as not to miss out on the high-paying position. If everything worked out, all his financial problems would be solved, and Ali could finally buy the car of his dreams and live the life he always wanted. Everything was going according to plan. However, the authorities had not made any progress in Gina's case, so they decided to introduce another undercover agent, codenamed Susie, into the operation. According to the cover story, she was Hawkins' girlfriend. Her objective was to get close to Ali's family and attempt to extract information from his wife, Melek. Over time, Melek and Susie indeed became best friends. The two couples frequently spent time together, celebrating holidays and going on vacations. Hakon and Susie brought toys for Ali's children and occasionally babysat them, but the case of Georgina remained at a standstill. No evidence, even indirect, linking Ali to the girl's disappearance could be found. Moreover, the undercover agents aroused suspicion in Ali's sister, who believed that these individuals had not entered her brother's life by chance. For some reason, she was somewhat skeptical of them, sensing that something was amiss. The woman even noticed that Susie and Hawken did not seem like a couple in love. If Ali had listened to his sister, everything might have turned out differently. But he had grown so accustomed to the role of a successful manager of a future business that he refused to listen to anyone. When the investigators realized that the man had no intention of tarnishing his reputation in front of his future employer, they decided to introduce another agent into the case, Hakon's cousin Kor, who had a criminal past. According to the cover story, he was a slippery character capable of committing crimes and possessed rather dubious proclivities. The authorities hoped that by acquainting himself with someone willing to break the law, Ali would be more forthcoming. In the absence of any physical evidence, they could only hope for the criminal's own confession. The investigators were prepared to invest a great deal of effort and time to obtain this from Ali. Kor and Ali quickly found common ground. It all began when the two men visited a brothel together. Ali, who had never cheated on his wife and strived to maintain this image in front of others, easily abandoned his principles the moment a young girl appeared on the horizon. Moreover, Kor paid for the pleasure out of his own pocket. The secret undercover agent explained to Ali that the money was obtained illegally, which was why he easily squandered it. Thus, they managed to see the suspect from two sides. As an exemplary family man who wanted to work for the sake of the future, and as a jovial reveler for whom his wife and children were not an obstacle when it came to pleasure. To ensure the credibility of the entire operation, the investigators had to rent a plot of land for the future car wash and sign a fictitious contract with Ali. Now, all hope rested on Kor. If he failed to engage the suspect in conversation, then Georgina's case could be safely filed away as unsolved. However, in 2018, something unexpected occurred. An unknown man called the police and stated that while he was not the perpetrator, he knew the location of the missing Georgina Kruger's body. The stranger provided coordinates where they should search for the high school student's remains and then hung up. Tracing the call proved unsuccessful, but a team of specialists was urgently dispatched to the specified location. The coordinates led to the Brizzy Langer Forest. The area was combed through thoroughly, but no traces of the girl were found. It remains unknown whether this call was someone's foolish prank or if someone wanted to further confuse the investigation. Unfortunately, the witness who led the detectives on a false trail could not be located. However, new leaflets were created for the Georgina Kruger case. They featured a special QR code that, when scanned, allowed one to hear the caller's voice. The authorities hoped that this method would enable someone to recognize the anonymous witness's voice, and at the same time, they wanted to use these flyers to lure Ali into a trap. They were curious to see how the suspect would react upon learning that someone had called the police regarding the high school student's whereabouts. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you like this video. It's really important. The detectives took advantage of Ali's passion for fast and expensive cars and rented his favorite Porsche model.
The vehicle was equipped with a listening device and a leaflet with Gina's photo and a QR code was placed on the back seat. Through their undercover agents, they allowed Ali and his wife Melek to take a ride in this car, hoping that a conversation about the girl's disappearance would arise between them. Initially, Ali and Melek did not notice the leaflet, but at some point, it caught their eye. The woman reacted very indifferently, merely expressing surprise that someone had called the police so many years after Georgina's disappearance. This was a normal reaction for someone not involved in the crime. However, Ali noticeably became nervous. He tried to speculate about who the caller might have been and what information this witness could possess. Additionally, Ali took the leaflet with him to a Turkish coffee shop and began showing it to his friends in an attempt to find out if they knew anything about the case. Later, he explained this interest by saying that he wanted to help the police. The investigators, on the other hand, wondered why a person with no connection to the disappearance would suddenly, after years, feel the need to gather information. Ali's actions only convinced the authorities that they were on the right track and needed to keep pursuing him. As for Melek, his wife, the detectives concluded that she knew nothing about her husband's actions and did not even suspect that he could be involved, which explained her lack of interest in the old case. The investigators were almost certain that Ali had kept the crime a secret from her. The detectives' further strategy was to utilize the friendly relationship that had developed between Ali and the undercover agent Kor for the benefit of the investigation. One day, Kor told Ali about his girlfriend and the problems she was causing him. They often argued. The thing was that Kor had supposedly wanted to break up with her for a long time, but couldn't do so for a rather delicate reason. His girlfriend was blackmailing him. Opening up, he shared his story with Ali. At some point in the past, the man had taken someone's life and foolishly confessed this to his girlfriend. No one knew about this except the two of them. Even his cousin Hawken was unaware. At some point, they had forgotten about the incident. But as soon as Kor mentioned breaking up, the girl threatened to go to the police and tell them everything. The man no longer knew how to extricate himself from this situation. He didn't want to go to prison and didn't want to remain under the blackmailer's thumb. So, he asked Ali for advice on what he would do in a similar case. Ali sympathized, but this did not bring the team any closer to investigating Georgina's disappearance. The investigators hoped that sooner or later, he would see Kor as an ally and become more forthcoming with him. The men continued to regularly discuss Kor's relationship problems. Ali suggested various solutions without uttering a word about his past transgressions. Kor decided to accelerate the process and one day made a 150,000 euro offer. He was ready to remove his girlfriend from his path by any means possible, even if it was illegal. The detectives knew that Ali was in desperate need of money since he had not yet started his job as the car wash manager, and the sum of 150,000 euros could pay off all his debts and allow him to change his life for the better, solving a host of other financial problems. Of course, Ali could not miss such an opportunity. He offered to rid Core of the blackmailer himself. He was eager to get the money, so he devised various scenarios on how best to carry out the job. The perpetrator clarified details such as the girl's weight, whether he would need a car, and where best to attack her. Ali was considering options for the crime, and the trap was about to snap shut. But the goal of investigating Georgina's case still had not been achieved. The detectives were fortunate that one day, while Ali and Kor were riding in a car together, a conversation took place between them that was recorded. Ali was again going over options for completing the task and how he could carry it out. He mentioned that he had even searched the internet for information on how best to dispose of a lifeless body. The undercover agent was stalling for time and allowing Ali to independently reason about the dangerous topic. He did not push him in any direction to avoid later being accused of incitement. After listening to Ali's thoughts, Kor told him that he did not believe Ali could take a person's life, even for a large sum of money. And that's when what the investigators had been waiting for over several months occurred. Ali and Kor discussed all the possible consequences of the crime and how the perpetrator himself imagined it. 
To confirm his readiness and convince his friend of his determination, Ali shared a story from his life, and it was the story of Georgina Kruger's disappearance. According to Ali, this girl was amazing. Every day at the same time on her way to and from school, she would pass by Ali's front door, heading to the bus stop. The man knew her approximate schedule, so he went outside every day just to see her. He wanted to get to know her better at all costs. On Monday, September 25th, 2006, Ali was standing at the entrance as usual when Gina got off the bus and headed towards her house in high spirits. That day, the girl was incredibly beautiful. Her eyes sparkled in a special way, and she was literally glowing with happiness. Ali approached the high school student with a request for help. He needed to carry several bags down to the basement. He even offered to pay the girl for the service. Gina, who often saw her neighbor with his children and family, had no idea how her assistance would end. In the basement of Ali's house were storage rooms. The man had turned a closet into a kind of room. As soon as the girl was inside, he hit her on the head. Georgina screamed in pain, and to somehow calm her down and make her be quiet, he struck her again with greater force. Gina lost consciousness and collapsed on the floor. Ali then told Kor in great detail what happened next. He regretted his actions, but realized that if he let Georgina out of the basement, he would again face prison time. He simply squeezed her neck with his hands and did not let go until Gina stopped breathing. Ali recounted the story of the terrible assault in such detail that he even mentioned how his knuckles later ached from the intense strain. His narration was very vivid and credible, with many details that would be impossible to make up if he had simply wanted to brag. After Georgina died, Ali hid her in his basement room for three days, then wrapped the body in an old carpet and simply threw it in the trash. Of course, the detectives checked this. They investigated the entire waste disposal process and learned that all the garbage is incinerated. So Gina Kruger's remains were completely destroyed, but Ali's confession was enough to make an arrest. They came for him in December 2018, 12 years after Gina's disappearance. Ali was at home with his daughter. All the premises belonging to his family were searched, but nothing linking him to the missing girl was found. During the interrogation, the man did not say a word. He remained silent when he was charged and later kept silent in court. Ali was in custody for a year and a half. He and his family were completely confident in an acquittal, as there was no real evidence against him. No DNA, no body, no witnesses, nothing but his confession. The prosecution team compared Ali's previous conviction with what he had told the undercover agent Kor, and much of it matched. It was the modus operandi of a single criminal. Nevertheless, it was Ali's detailed account of the events of that day that convinced the jury and the judge that this man was guilty of the death of 14-year-old Georgina Kruger, a girl who might have been destined for world fame in the movie industry. Gina's mother, Vesna Kruger, had hoped all this time that her daughter had simply run away from home. The woman didn't even entertain the thought that the girl was no longer alive. After all, there was no evidence that she had been attacked and abducted in broad daylight. The news of the neighbor's arrest and his subsequent conviction broke the mother's heart. Somewhere deep down, she wished the accusation was a mistake. After all, it would have rekindled her hope that someday she would meet her Gina. On March 17, 2020, Ali was sentenced to life imprisonment. Subsequently, he claimed that he was a victim in this case. He had agreed to act as a hitman for Kor's girlfriend only to save her and get her out of harm's way. In fact, he intended to go to the police and expose Kor's plan. Lawyers advised Ali to remain silent in court, so he was unable to tell his own version of events. The man still insists that he had nothing to do with Georgina Kruger's disappearance. However, the confession speaks for itself. Surprisingly, Ali's family also believes that he was wrongfully convicted. The police simply spent a lot of time and money trying to expose him, and to somehow justify the expenses, they pinned the crime on him. Only one man knows the whole truth, and now behind bars, perhaps one day his conscience will overcome him and he will admit to the evil he has done. This is the end of the story. Like the video and leave your thoughts in the comments. This was Jeremy. See you soon.
Picture a massive two-story house with a private airstrip behind it and a boat bobbing on the waves near the ocean shore. In this dwelling lived the McIver family, two lovers in a tropical forest. They were preparing to become parents, but their dream was brutally shattered one dark night. Susan Michelle McIver was born on July 24, 1962, in Pennsylvania. From early childhood, everyone called her Missy. She was an incredibly kind, responsive person who adored spending time with young children. In all her games, she played the role of a mother or caregiver. Her affection for little ones grew into a desire to teach them important and useful things, so Missy decided to become a teacher. Due to her agreeable and peaceful nature, she was loved by both children and adults. She had a knack for explaining complex concepts in simple terms. People felt at ease in her presence, making teaching her true calling. After finishing high school, Missy enrolled at Florida International University to finally pursue her dream of becoming an educator. While living in Florida, she occasionally visited local bars with her friends to unwind and have fun. It was there that a young man named Tim noticed her. They met and chatted briefly before returning to their respective groups. Tim wasn't looking for a life partner, as he already had a girlfriend, but Missy managed to capture his attention somehow. Tim only remembered the attractive stranger a week later when he went to the same bar with his younger brother. Michael McIver was just over 20 years old. Despite his age, he was a determined, responsible person. He set goals for himself and persistently worked towards achieving them. At that point, Michael decided it was time to settle down, start a family, have children, and focus on building his own future. He shared this with his older brother Tim at the bar. The thing is, being engrossed in masculine pursuits, Michael was completely inexperienced in approaching girls and felt somewhat shy around them. It was then that Tim, Michael's older brother, recalled the lovely stranger he had met and exchanged a few words with at the bar just a week ago. He pictured her gentle, sweet gaze, endearing smile, and thought such a girl would be perfect for his modest brother. As if by magic, Missy entered the nightclub accompanied by a friend. Perhaps it was destiny, love at first sight. Tim hadn't even said a word yet, but Michael couldn't take his eyes off the girl of his dreams. The young people met, and after that, they were practically inseparable. Friends, over 90% of viewers watch videos without subscribing to the channel. Check if you're subscribed. If not, please be so kind as to subscribe to the channel to support me. They talked all night long, and just a few weeks after meeting, officially declared themselves a couple. They were two kindred spirits, seemingly destined from above to be together for life and die on the same day. Missy managed to bring out the best qualities in the modest young man, while Michael awakened and elevated her feminine appeal to a new level. Michael McIver was born on April 15, 1961, in Ohio. Besides him, the family had three other children, two brothers, Tim and James, and a sister, Sharon. As it happened, Michael's fate was linked to airplanes from birth, following in his parents' footsteps. His mother obtained a pilot's license at 16, which was quite rare at the time. Later, she worked as a flight attendant. Michael's father was an airline pilot, so the McIver's entire life was closely tied to the sky. Naturally, the boys also became fascinated with planes. From childhood, they spent all their free time at the airfield, observing mechanics at work and studying aircraft structure. As he grew older, Michael, like his parents, made aviation his life's work. From age 13, he flew with his father and learned to operate a plane, and by 17, he could easily repair aircraft engines, devise new concepts, and experiment with airliner equipment. To supplement his practical skills with theory, Michael graduated from the University of Miami and became a professional pilot. He continued his parents' legacy, making aviation his profession. Over time, he also became the owner of an aircraft repair company. Michael was intelligent and enterprising. Not wanting to rest on his laurels, he decided that his future family should definitely live in paradise. He chose Key West, Florida as their residence, primarily because it was an ideal place to raise future children. 
In 1989, Michael and Missy relocated to their dream home in a small town called Tavernier. The two-story house was magnificent. A spacious, glassed-in veranda encircled the building's perimeter at the second-floor level. But the dwelling's uniqueness lay in the private airstrip adjacent to it. Residents of this community could land their planes right behind their own homes. In addition, Michael and Missy owned a boat, so besides flying, they could enjoy water excursions, go diving, and fish. It was an ideal place to live, a tropical paradise with few inhabitants. In May 1990, Michael and Missy officially formalized their relationship. They had already achieved what they wanted, so they decided against a lavish wedding, instead holding the ceremony in their backyard with only their closest friends and family. In January of the following year, they learned exciting news. The young wife was pregnant. The couple had long dreamed of having children. They planned to have several sons and daughters, but the arrival of their firstborn was always the most thrilling event for expectant parents. Michael and Missy began preparing the nursery. They learned the baby's gender in advance. It was to be a boy. They even chose a name, Kyle Patrick McIver. Michael was 30, Missy 29. They were happy working at jobs they loved, had a splendid home, and the arrival of their son was set to elevate their relationship to an entirely new level. By then, Michael was thriving in his business, while Missy was a beloved elementary school teacher. The children adored her and eagerly rushed to class for her lessons. Soon, their home would be filled with a baby's cries. In their spare time, husband and wife painted walls themselves, bought furniture and toys for the nursery. The mother-to-be was very proud of the baby's bedroom, showing it off to all their guests. To finish everything before the child's birth, the couple hired a contractor for home renovations. Preparing for the baby's arrival was the most exciting time for Missy. She was already in her eighth month of pregnancy and in just a couple of weeks anticipated the arrival of little Kyle into this world. Unfortunately, their entire life, woven from love and happiness, would be brutally shattered in one night, and nothing they had planned would ever come to pass. On that fateful evening of August 21, 1991, the McIver couple returned from a parenting class late, around 9 p.m. A powerful tropical storm had erupted. Michael and Missy managed to take shelter under their home's roof from the approaching rain driven by strong winds. Such natural phenomena are not uncommon in a tropical climate. So the storm only slightly dampened their clothes as husband and wife exited the car. The next morning, it was as if the hurricane had never happened. The sun shone, and the only reminders of the bad weather were scattered palm leaves and branches everywhere. Everything was proceeding as usual, except that Missy didn't show up for classes. The school administration tried to call the McIvers, but no one answered. Colleagues immediately became concerned, as Missy's due date was approaching, so anything could have happened. School staff called Michael's sister Sharon to find out where the couple had disappeared to, but she also didn't understand what was going on. Her brother hadn't called her, and none of the relatives knew where the husband and wife had gone. Sharon knew they couldn't have left without informing their loved ones, and she immediately had a bad feeling. Just in case, the woman called the police, asking them to check if everything was all right at her brother's house. Meanwhile, two of Missy's colleagues were already standing at the McIver's front door, futilely trying to get the owner's attention. The doors were locked, and no one appeared in response to the knocking. The women decided to walk around the house and peer through the windows. Perhaps Missy had fallen ill and needed help, but instead of the pregnant woman, they glimpsed someone's legs through the living room window. Terrified, the school employees rushed to the nearest house and asked a neighbor for help. The man didn't wait for the police to arrive, kicking down the door. He hurried, hoping to provide necessary aid to the victim. But as soon as he glanced at Michael's body lying in the living room, and it was indeed him, the neighbor realized there was nothing he could do to help. The horrifying crime in a private gated community was shocking in itself, not to mention that it happened to the McIvers, a family adored by everyone in the area. Police arriving at the scene immediately called in a forensics team, as there was clear evidence of a crime. 
Officers methodically searched the large house, trying to note any clues. Not all rooms were inhabited. Some were still undergoing renovation. Paint cans stood everywhere with newspapers and building materials on the floor. The house itself was a two-level structure with several entrances. The second floor rooms could be accessed directly from outside via a glass-enclosed veranda, which had its own staircase. At first glance, there were no signs of struggle or forced entry in the house. Things were generally in their places, considering the ongoing renovations. The living room also seemed undisturbed. Sofa, TV, coffee table, and right behind the sofa lay the lifeless homeowner. It appeared he had been attacked as he was preparing for bed. The man wore a red and white striped undershirt, light shorts and white socks. He was lying on his back, legs splayed. His eyes and mouth were covered with white socks and wrapped with painter's tape. The remaining roll of tape still lay on the coffee table, inches from Michael's body. Some blood had flowed from his nose, staining his shirt, and visible bruises marked his neck. It's possible he was deprived of oxygen. But the most horrifying detail was a footprint, not on the floor, but on Michael's throat. Missy McIver's body was found in the master bedroom. It lay on a cream-colored blanket thrown from the bed onto the floor. The woman was completely undressed. Her hands and feet were bound with clothesline and wrapped with painter's tape. Her fingers were clenched into fists, indicating severe pain before death. A black belt was wrapped several times around her neck and her hair was tangled into a dense knot. Her eyes, like Michael's, were hastily covered with pieces of painter's tape. Under the blanket on which the homeowner lay, investigators found a nightgown with torn out buttons and underwear cut into pieces by something sharp. Apparently, Missy had been sexually assaulted. In the bedroom, detectives found a 22 caliber pistol casing and a hole in the curtains. The sliding glass door leading to the terrace was open, and a fan was still running in the room. It was humid and hot. Phone cables in the house had been cut. The perpetrator had planned everything. During such bad weather, all the McIver's neighbors were indoors. Due to thunder, strong winds, and rain noise, no one heard any screams. The homeowners were prevented from seeking help by other means. Based on the initial examination, detectives surmised this was not a random burglar. The attack was clearly planned. But why was a couple expecting a child the main target? Who could they have crossed that the perpetrator didn't even spare an unborn baby? The metal rod wrapped in a towel found on the kitchen floor was among the pieces of evidence. In the bedroom dresser, investigators discovered clotheslines similar to that restraining Missy's hands and feet. This suggested the perpetrator used items found in the house rather than bringing them along. A notebook with torn out pages was also among the evidence. It had previously contained alphabetically ordered addresses and phone numbers. This could indicate that the attack was committed by someone acquainted with the McIvers. Nothing was stolen. Jewelry boxes remained in place with all contents intact. Household appliances and the TV also didn't interest the criminal. However, a long ladder was leaning against the glass-enclosed veranda on the second floor outside. Most likely, the perpetrator climbed it to the second floor and entered one of the bedrooms through sliding doors. Outside, investigators found tire tracks and several footprints in the sand. Due to the recent storm, the sand was too wet to make a cast so forensics limited themselves to photographing the print for future comparison with suspect's shoes. The contractor doing renovation work was first on this list. The long ladder belonged to him. He knew the layout of the rooms and could have seen where things were kept. However, before proceeding with the investigation, they had to inform the relatives already gathering at the McIver's house that Michael and Missy were dead. Sharon noticed from afar the yellow tape typically used to cordon off crime scenes stretched around her brother's house, and her heart sank. Her whole body went numb at once. On unsteady legs, she approached closer and saw the parents who had arrived before her. The horrific news instantly shattered the peaceful life of the gated community. No one wanted to believe it had really happened. Michael's parents, aged years in one morning, only knew that their son and daughter-in-law were no longer alive. This is what they told Sharon as she approached. Michael's sister couldn't understand how this was possible. 
as just a couple of days ago she had been in this house, seen the nursery, and discussed with Missy where to put things in their future son's room, and now none of them were alive. After Sharon, Michael's two brothers, James and Tim, arrived at the house. The most incredible coincidence was that August 22nd was Tim's birthday. The terrible surprise left by the criminal would now overshadow this once joyous occasion for the rest of his days. Tim had been so proud of introducing Michael and Missy, happy that everything was going well for them, and now he felt nothing but emotional pain. Meanwhile, the victim's bodies were sent to the medical examiner's office for autopsies. The saddest part was that not two, but three people had died. Little Kyle Patrick McIver lived for about 30 minutes after Missy's death. He was quite viable, but it was not meant for him to enter this world. The cause of Michael's death was a blow to the head with a heavy object followed by strangulation. The assailant likely stunned the man with the metal rod wrapped in a towel when he came down to investigate a noise. Bruises on the homeowner's neck showed that a rope had been wrapped around it several times and pulled back with full force. He was conscious for a maximum of 10, 15 seconds. Additionally, several vertebrae were broken. This occurred because the perpetrator stepped on Michael's throat with full force, which is why a boot print was left on his neck. Internal bleeding in the left shoulder and significant bruising in the abdominal area also indicated that Michael was struck not only on the head. External examination of Missy revealed ligature marks on her neck. The woman fought for her life and tried to loosen the rope, causing friction. Her agony lasted longer because she managed to delay her death. Either the criminal cut off her air supply and she lost consciousness, or when he loosened the rope, Missy regained consciousness. The lower part of her body was covered with small cuts. The expectant mother resisted as much as she could, not wanting to risk her baby's health. After the attack, she was left there to die alone. The pathologist was able to obtain DNA samples from seminal fluid left on Missy's body and on sheets in the McIver's house. This significantly facilitated identifying the perpetrator. However, another DNA sample was needed for comparison as the police found no matches in their database. Detectives began compiling a list of potential suspects. First on it was the contractor performing construction work at the McIver's house. His surname began with a letter from the address book page that was missing. The worker was fully prepared to cooperate, but he was angered that some evidence pointed directly at him. Both Michael and Missy had become close to him. Therefore, the man was upset that he was suspected of attacking his friends. His boot prints were left in the sand near the house. He knew how to enter unnoticed, and it was his long ladder leaning against the terrace. Fortunately, he had an alibi. Additionally, the contractor agreed to provide a DNA sample, and it did not match the DNA found at the crime scene. Detectives learned that Missy had called her sister Marcia around 10.30 p.m., but she wasn't home. A message was left on the answering machine, with Missy promising to call back the next day. This provided investigators with a clue about the events of that terrible night. It appeared the McIvers were alive at 10.30 p.m. The storm began around 5 p.m. and continued until midnight, intensifying each hour. The hurricane peaked in the second half of the night. Phone lines were cut shortly after Missy's call to her sister. Relatives also informed detectives that Missy had been married before Michael. Since the crime seemed very personal and largely directed against the woman, police decided to question the ex-husband living in Miami. Due to extensive media coverage of the McIver family tragedy investigation, it was known in other states. A doctor who knew Missy's former husband called the police. He reported that the man was unhappy about the divorce and genuinely upset upon hearing Missy had remarried and was pregnant. Apparently, he still had some attachment to his first wife. Investigators now focused on gathering more information about this person and discovered he had a criminal record for petty theft. In the absence of other suspects, the ex-husband seemed an ideal fit for the perpetrator. He could have become enraged and committed the crime. During questioning, the man denied everything insisting he had no connection to the attack on Missy and Michael. He also had an alibi for that night. He was in Miami and couldn't have been near the McIver's house. 
The former husband was genuinely shocked when he learned of his first wife's death. He willingly provided a DNA sample, which showed no match. The investigation again reached a dead end. The Tavernier community, accustomed to living safely, began locking doors, buying weapons for protection, and installing home security systems. People feared the criminal might live nearby and didn't want to share the McIver family's fate. Despite residents' pressure on authorities, the investigation stalled. Almost a year passed. Investigators checked all possible leads, questioned several more suspects, but DNA results didn't match. They had to start over. It was then that detectives decided to delve deeper into Michael McIver's professional activities. Perhaps the businessman was actually the perpetrator's potential target. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you like this video. It's really important. Detectives learned that Michael spent much time traveling the world as a pilot. Relatives working in the aviation industry shared suspicions that Michael might have been involuntarily involved in a dangerous and illegal scheme. The private airstrip behind the house could have attracted people engaged in transporting illegal substances. Michael, dreaming of a tropical paradise for his family, might have been forcibly drawn into smuggling. He had always dreamed of earning big money, and this could have brought him financial stability. But something went wrong, and Michael was killed. Alternatively, he might have refused to participate, paying with his life and the lives of those he loved most. Investigators now questioned whether McIver's business was somehow linked to illegal activities. Could aircraft repair be just a cover for something much more serious? The day before the incident, Michael's brother James had given him all his savings to buy a plane in Belize at an excellent price. Michael went there to make the deal. This transaction was legal. The plane, seized from drug dealers, was being sold by the police department through an auction. All this hype, supplemented by inaccurate assumptions from reporters, caused a wave of condemnation of Michael's actions. Although it later turned out that the deal was legal, and McIver was in no way connected to smuggling, the family, already in mourning, received a considerable amount of negative attention. Their son's reputation was tarnished without any objective evidence. Losing Michael along with his wife and unborn child was a terrible tragedy, and portraying him as a smuggler was beyond the pale. Investigators spent a lot of time developing this theory, but it all turned out to be empty speculation, unsupported by any objective evidence. Instead of abandoning this theory, detectives decided to investigate the activities of Michael's brother James. What if he was involved in transporting illegal substances and Michael was blackmailing him? When James McIver noticed he was being followed, he came to the police station and simply provided a DNA sample to put an end to all these rumors about illegal business. Naturally, no matches were found and the family was left alone with investigators deciding to look elsewhere. Detectives spent two years investigating the illegal drug trafficking angle and were now completely at a loss. They decided to involve the FBI. A criminal profile was created, which differed significantly from all previous suspects. A crucial factor was what this person did to a woman who was eight months pregnant. Not everyone is capable of such a heartless crime. It requires a certain personality type. The profiler suggested that the perpetrator was obsessed with Missy. He likely had previous experience with home invasions, knowing what actions to take. Michael's presence at home didn't concern him at all. He was determined to get to Missy at any cost. The criminal had been observing the woman, knew her daily routine and the layout of the house. The FBI concluded that this man was a local resident who might have crossed paths with Missy during the day. Therefore, they began looking for someone with a criminal past who had some contact with the deceased woman. In the final months of her pregnancy, Missy visited the same places, grocery store, hospital, gas station, and the school where she continued teaching. She spent most of her time at home preparing for the baby's arrival. Police began investigating the identities of employees at places Missy McIver frequented most in recent months, paying special attention to those with criminal backgrounds, including burglary or violent crimes. Detectives also spoke with relatives, and Sharon remembered Missy casually mentioning a guy at the local gas station who tried to hit on her despite her pregnancy. This gas station was the closest to the McIver's home, 
Missy passed by it every morning and stopped for coffee on her way to work. Investigators revisited evidence found at the crime scene and noticed several gas station receipts among them. Finally, the police had another potential suspect. This man was named Thomas Mitchell Overton. He was allegedly involved in several burglaries and was linked to an attack on a 20-year-old girl that ended in her death. The crime, committed in May 1990, remained unsolved. Rachel Surrett, the girl's name, was last seen when her father dropped her off at a local cinema in Tavernier. Two weeks later, tourists stumbled upon her body wrapped in a tarp in the woods. She had previously told her father about a guy working at the cinema who constantly harassed her. The most shocking part was that Thomas Overton once worked at this place. He was under suspicion, but no evidence of his involvement in the girl's death was found. Rachel and Missy looked somewhat similar, and both women openly rejected Thomas's advances, further strengthening investigators' suspicions. However, the problem was that detectives couldn't simply ask the man to provide a DNA sample without legal grounds, and 36-year-old Thomas Overton was unlikely to voluntarily incriminate himself. So the police decided to wait until the suspect committed another crime. Six months later, an officer spotted an oddly dressed individual cycling at 3 a.m. The policeman checked the person's ID, revealing him to be Thomas Overton. Approximately 15 minutes after, the station received a call from a young woman reporting an intruder in her home. The perpetrator had fled, but left a lipstick message on the bathroom mirror, threatening to end the homeowner's life next time. Subsequently, another incident occurred where Thomas was actually arrested for trespassing, but as it wasn't a felony, they had to release him. Law enforcement continued surveillance, albeit with less fervor than before. No new developments in the McIver family case emerged until 1996. Five years had passed since the couple's demise when a close associate of Thomas, a criminal seeking to become an informant to clear his own charges, aided the investigation. He notified the police that Thomas was planning another robbery, providing the house address and timing of the intended crime. Officers set up an ambush, enabling them to apprehend Thomas as he was cutting phone lines. A firearm was found on him. As a convicted felon in Florida was prohibited from possessing a gun, this served as an additional grounds for his arrest. On October 6, 1996, Thomas Mitchell Overton was apprehended on charges of burglary. Investigators hoped to obtain a DNA sample, but the suspect refused to provide it voluntarily. Acquiring a warrant would have taken several months, and Thomas seemingly anticipated the consequences for him. At one point, while still in custody, the man attempted to harm himself by deliberately slashing his throat with a disposable razor. He intended to be taken to the hospital and make an escape. From the towels used to stanch the injured man's bleeding, a DNA sample was collected. In November 1996, Thomas's DNA was compared to the DNA found on a bedding sample from the McIver residence. The blood matched. On October 17, 1998, two years after his arrest, Thomas Overton's trial commenced. DNA evidence was presented in court along with testimony from two witnesses, fellow inmates who had shared a cell with the suspect at different times. One of them claimed Thomas admitted to committing burglaries in an affluent area of the Florida Keys and taking someone's life. He also shared his usual security measures for burglaries, cutting phone lines, wearing gloves, carrying a gun and knife, and using disguises. To another inmate, Thomas Overton allegedly said the best time for robbery was during power outages or bad weather. He then told an implausible story, insisting that Missy McIver behaved erratically at a gas station when encountering him. Some days she was pleasant, smiling and even flirting, while other days she acted like a witch. After glimpsing Missy's address on a gas receipt, Thomas began observing the McIver home. On August 21, 1991, the criminal decided to execute his terrible plan. He cut the phone lines and placed a ladder against the balcony. This action made some noise, and lights came on in the house. After waiting for quiet, he climbed the ladder and entered through a guest bedroom. While examining the premises, he heard Michael, the homeowner, wake up and go to the kitchen refrigerator. Thomas panicked, 
and stealthily approached from behind, striking the man's head with an iron rod found in one of the rooms. Michael didn't immediately lose consciousness, so the intruder punched him several times to knock him out. At that moment, he noticed Missy, who had witnessed everything. The lady of the house tried to hide in the bedroom. According to Thomas, he caught up with her and bound her with items from a dresser, then attempted to persuade her to cooperate. But Missy said she knew who he was. Meanwhile, the perpetrator worried Michael might regain consciousness. He returned to the living room, covered the unconscious man's eyes with socks, and wrapped his head with masking tape. Thomas couldn't resist taking advantage of Missy's helplessness, having been attracted to her earlier at the gas station. He violated her, then tightened a rope around the woman's neck and took her life, planning to leave no witnesses. Afterwards, the criminal returned to the living room and ended Michael McIver's life. In his conversations with other inmates, Thomas claimed he knew nothing about a bullet hole in the curtains and that he deliberately tore pages from a notebook to confuse investigators. He then confessed that his goal wasn't robbery, but to obtain Missy's body. On March 18, 1999, eight years after the attack on the McIver family, 41-year-old Thomas Overton was found guilty and sentenced to death for the slaughter of three people, including the unborn Kyle Patrick McIver. After the sentence was announced, Thomas turned to face the crowd and smiled, he mockingly waved at Michael's sister, Sharon, suggesting he'd gladly do the same to her. Michael's parents couldn't bear the heavy loss. Soon after the case concluded, they passed away one after another, following their son. Thomas Overton, who robbed an entire family of their future, still remains on death row awaiting execution, feeling quite content with himself. This is the end of the story. Like the video and leave your thoughts in the comments. This was Jeremy. See you soon. This incident occurred in 2013 in Bakersfield, California. Todd Eric Chance was born on March 10, 1968, to Diana and Travis Chance. Shortly after, his younger brother Scott came along. They all resided on a farm in the small town of Shafter, not far from Bakersfield. Both boys weren't afraid of hard work and helped their parents raise pigs and horses from a young age. Todd was described as a true cowboy. From his youth, he adored wearing a cowboy hat and boots, enjoyed off-road riding with his father, and was passionate about race cars. When the young man became old enough to drive, his parents gifted him a blue Mustang Cobra, and he transformed into a handsome young cowboy with his own iron steed. As a result, he never lacked female attention. His mother Diana said he was a real magnet for girls. Every day, notes would appear on his car's windshield from some love-struck admirer leaving her phone number with a request to call. Young ladies were attracted to his sports car and to him, but lately there was only one woman who captured Todd's imagination. Her name was Jenny. Jenny worked as a cashier at a local pharmacy. This young woman had already been married to her high school sweetheart, but their married life was short-lived as her spouse began to stray. They divorced due to his constant infidelity. Consequently, Jenny became a single mother to a little daughter. She believed that if she ever married again, she would choose an unattractive, overweight man who would cherish her as a woman. These were the thoughts in the divorced lady's mind when an attractive young man named Todd Chance, who had recently finished high school, started working as a security guard at their pharmacy. Jenny immediately noticed him, but considered Todd a ladies' man and a player with women's hearts, so she tried to keep him at arm's length. It wasn't long before the woman changed her opinion about Todd, getting to know him better. He turned out to be quite different from how she had imagined him. Todd wasn't a womanizer. He genuinely fell in love with Jenny and accepted her daughter Jessica as his own. The gentle, caring man managed to melt the single mother's heart, making her feel worthy of happiness again. From this point, their relationship developed very quickly. Eventually, Jenny and Todd married in 1996. They had two more daughters, Samantha and Sarah. Despite her successful marriage, Jenny didn't plan to spend her entire life as a cashier. In addition to the pharmacy, the woman managed to juggle two more jobs. 
She dreamed of earning a degree in education and did everything to pay for college tuition. Since Todd's childhood love extended to all vehicles, be it sports cars, passenger cars, or motorcycles, he got a job as a truck driver and focused on setting up their family home while his wife finished her teaching studies. Friends, over 90% of viewers watch videos without subscribing to the channel. Check if you're subscribed. If not, please be so kind as to subscribe to the channel to support me. After obtaining her coveted certificate, Jenny began working as an administrator at Fairview Elementary School. She was extremely hardworking and always strived to achieve her set goals. Mrs. Chance was determined to accomplish something in this life, even if it meant juggling three jobs. Having come a long way in her career, starting from school secretary and ending up as an assistant manager, Jenny eventually became the principal of Fairview Elementary School. And Todd, who had a passion for cars since childhood, made a career working in the trucking industry for over 15 years. Now that Jenny's income as a school principal had increased, the family could afford luxurious vacations and provide their daughters with an excellent life. Todd was the best husband and father one could dream of. He had always been hardworking, but his family became his main priority. The man spent all his free time with the girls, played video games, engaged in sports, and tried to support all their endeavors. Jessica, Jenny's daughter from her first marriage, considered Todd her father. He was always there for her, which was something she didn't get from her biological father. By the summer of 2013, Jessica had moved out of the family home, having settled her personal life, while Samantha and Sarah were teenagers at the time. The whole family decided to go on a family vacation to San Francisco and Las Vegas, and they had a great time. The girls called it the best summer ever, and just a few weeks after returning from vacation, Todd Chance was found dead. On August 25, 2013, at 9.27 a.m., the police received a call to the Almond Grove, located 15 miles from Bakersfield, where local workers had discovered a body. According to them, at 7.30 a.m., they had driven through the area and there was no body there. Consequently, the corpse must have been dumped after 7.30. When emergency responders arrived at the scene, they were able to immediately identify the deceased as 45-year-old Todd Chance because he had a wallet with identification documents on him. His mobile phone was lying 39 feet away from the body. Nearby, there were also tire tracks imprinted, but the vehicle itself was missing. The man had been shot twice in the chest, with one of the bullets passing through his right arm. Both shots were fired at close range, and the fact that one of them pierced his arm indicated Todd's attempt to defend himself. The investigation began almost immediately. Detectives wanted to figure out how this happened and why someone would want to take Todd's life. Robbery was ruled out, as the wallet found in his pocket and the nearby mobile phone suggested that the perpetrator had little interest in cash. However, Todd's pride and joy, his black 2011 Mustang, was nowhere to be found. The police theorized that the man might have fallen victim to a carjacking. Perhaps someone had coveted his vehicle. Detectives began searching for the vehicle in the Bakersfield area. It was then that several residents from a nearby neighborhood, known for its high crime rate, called the police. People thought their district wasn't the best place for such a beautiful and expensive car. They found it suspicious that someone had left a Mustang in a place where various gangs operated and illicit substances were openly distributed. The police, wasting no time, went to the address where the black car had been seen. The vehicle was unlocked, the keys were lying on the floor, there, detectives also found a 38 caliber revolver with two spent casings, so they immediately thought this was the murder weapon, although it was quite strange to leave it in the car of the person who had been killed. Forensic examination of the Mustang revealed fingerprints and DNA belonging to Jenny Chance. Her prints were found on the driver's side door and on the gear shift. This wasn't unusual, as Jenny was Todd's wife and could have used his car, but this observation puzzled investigators. Their theory related to car theft didn't fit with the emerging circumstances. What was the point of stealing a Mustang, shooting the driver, only to then abandon the vehicle unlocked and with the keys inside? 
Detectives took a dirt sample from the floor mat and a swab from the front seat, but all the additional information obtained only disproved their carjacking theory. The Black Mustang meant a lot to Todd Chance. It's safe to say it was his fourth child, which he cared for, cherished, and nurtured. And he would never have voluntarily left the car in such a questionable place. Everything pointed to a targeted attack on Todd. Someone clearly wanted him dead. Most likely the perpetrators left Todd's car in this remote area to mislead investigators. The coroner, after conducting an autopsy, described the incident as a planned execution. According to the report, Todd died within 10 minutes, and since the shots were fired from just a few inches away, either wound could have been fatal. Now the authorities had a new theory. The theory was that he was actually shot in his own car, and then the body was dumped in the almond grove. He was already dead when he was left there. After Todd was found, his shoes were spotlessly clean, and the grove was quite dusty. If he had walked through it, his sneakers would have been dusty too. Later that day, police went to the Chance family home to inform Jenny that her husband had been found shot dead. Soon, Todd's three daughters and parents also learned this tragic news, and they were all in complete shock. Who needed to take the life of a man uninvolved in any questionable dealings? Todd didn't gamble, didn't use illegal substances. He was a quiet family man who spent all his time with his family. Jessica, Jenny's daughter from her first marriage, said that Todd had been in her life since she was four years old. He was her father, her friend, and one of the closest people to her. Jenny herself managed to stay calm and composed during this emotionally turbulent time for their family. She did everything possible to assist the police. She provided phone records, bank statements, and recounted the events of that morning. According to the woman, Todd left the house between 7.30 and 8 a.m. He told his wife he was going to a gun show with his father, Travis. Like his father, Todd was a big fan and collector of firearms. Jenny herself was working at home on the computer that morning while their two daughters slept, and the girls also confirmed her words, saying they saw their mom at the laptop around 9.30 or 10 a.m. The police also asked Jenny to check Todd's gun safe and collection, to ensure no weapons were missing. Turns out the 38 caliber pistol was missing. His wife said it was unusual for her husband to take a gun with him. Perhaps Todd wanted to sell it or make a trade, considering he was heading to an exhibition where there are always plenty of gun enthusiasts. It appeared that the man was shot with his own revolver, as this 38 caliber model was found in the Mustang. The next step detectives took was to question people who knew the deceased's family and here, strange inconsistencies began to appear in the investigation. Todd's father, Travis, said he had no idea about any gun show. He and his son hadn't seen each other before this and hadn't arranged to go to a gun exhibition. They had no plans to meet that day at all. This was fundamentally different from what Jenny told the police. So either the wife was lying, or Travis was lying, or Todd had lied to his wife about his plans. Now the police had to independently get to the bottom of who was telling the truth. The detectives started by looking into the gun show. It turned out to be real, and indeed taking place that morning in the eastern part of the city. However, Todd's body was found west of Bakersfield, in the completely opposite direction. So it was unlikely he was actually planning to visit the exhibition. The police then checked Todd's mobile phone to get a better understanding of what was happening. They made a surprising discovery. In Todd's phone, they found several explicit photos of his ex-fiancee, a woman named Carrie Williams. Besides the pictures, there were quite flirtatious messages where the former lovers discussed their personal lives, including Jenny. This gave the detectives a new perspective on the situation. They indeed got the impression that the wife was unusually calm and composed when first informed about Todd's death. She clearly didn't resemble a grief-stricken, loving spouse. The peculiarity with the gun show also pointed to an inconsistency in Jenny's story. It appeared that the man wasn't planning to go there, as he ended up in a completely different part of town. His father, Travis, also hadn't arranged with his son about a joint trip that day, and the messages found in Todd's phone potentially indicated his affair with his ex-fiancee. All of this together didn't look very good, 
and could be a motive for the crime. The investigation was clearly not turning out in Jenny's favor. It's possible that Todd lied to his wife about the gun show while actually planning to meet Carrie during that time. His spouse, discovering Todd's correspondence with his ex in his phone, could have guessed about the budding romance and shot her husband in a fit of rage. Todd's relationship with Carrie Williams predated his meeting with Jenny, so the woman might have known about the girl Todd dated before her, and she didn't hesitate to use this information, pointing detectives to Carrie as a potential perpetrator. In reality, Todd and Carrie had ended on very bad terms. It was a rather unpleasant breakup, and they didn't communicate for a long time. The former lovers only reunited in 2012, a year before the tragic incident. The police didn't yet understand what motive Carrie might have had, so they decided to talk to her and find out what connected her to the deceased, besides the explicit photos and correspondence. Firstly, Carrie Williams had an ironclad alibi. During the crime, she was with her daughter at the mission in San Juan Capistrano, which currently functions as a museum. Her whereabouts were documented by a parking ticket. Moreover, the woman explained that they indeed reconnected with Todd after a long time on the internet. They had been communicating for several months, reminiscing about their youth, discussing their personal lives, exchanging photos, but they hadn't met in person once. Todd's first fiancé had to be excluded from the list of suspects. The detectives, having Jenny Chance under suspicion, decided not to accuse someone without concrete evidence, but instead to find irrefutable proof, and their efforts were successful. The investigators found several disturbing signs pointing to the real perpetrator. At the beginning, they had the victim's mobile phone, gun, and car. The forensic examination didn't reveal any foreign fingerprints or DNA traces, so the detectives returned to the place where Todd's car was abandoned. They decided to visit houses on that street and talk to residents, hoping someone noticed something important. The police managed to find several witnesses who saw an unknown middle-aged woman near the car that morning. Her hair was tucked under a baseball cap and large sunglasses concealed her face. The stranger got out of the black Mustang and went somewhere. Besides talking to witnesses, Detectives also noticed several surveillance cameras whose footage confirmed that Todd's car was indeed left in that area by a woman. She had a red backpack on her back and a plastic bag in her hands. Initially, there were some disagreements about the gender of the person in the footage. However, comparing the video image with witness descriptions, detectives became convinced it was indeed a woman. The authorities decided to track the stranger by requesting recordings from other cameras along her route. After abandoning Todd's car, the suspect headed to a fast-food cafe in the nearest shopping complex. She didn't buy anything but went straight to the restroom. When the woman reappeared on the recordings, she was wearing completely different clothes and shoes. In the plastic bag, detectives could make out something that looked like a yellow container lid. They assumed it was a package of disinfectant wipes that the stranger used to clean the crime scene. After changing, the woman left the cafe without buying anything. A few seconds later, a surveillance camera near the waste containers captured her. She made a quick hand gesture as if throwing something away. At 9.22 a.m., she was spotted in a supermarket where the suspect used a payphone to call a taxi. When she came back into the camera's view, her plastic bag no longer contained the disinfectant wipes. Most likely, they were thrown into the nearest trash bin as an empty package of wet wipes would hardly have aroused anyone's interest. The next series of surveillance camera footage showed the woman getting into the arrived taxi and around 10 a.m., the taxi stopped at the Chance residence and dropped someone off. Additional camera recordings were also found showing Todd Chance's black Mustang heading towards the Almond Grove around 8 a.m., where the body was later found. It's impossible to see who was driving the car in the footage. Then. At about 8.30, the car was driving in the opposite direction. At 8.57, the car was spotted again near the area where it was subsequently abandoned. This happened just when workers discovered Todd's body in the almond grove. Although it seemed clear, the problem was that all the surveillance camera footage was of very poor quality, making it difficult to identify the woman. While detectives were almost certain it was Jenny Chance, 
They had nothing concrete on her except for grainy, slightly blurred images. Four days after Todd's death, the police called Jenny to the station to retrieve her deceased husband's car. The widow arrived accompanied by her father-in-law, Travis. They were immediately separated into different rooms and interrogated, after which they were shown the surveillance camera footage. Travis didn't recognize the woman in the footage. She didn't remind him of anyone, and the man had no idea who would need to take his son's car only to abandon it in a remote neighborhood. When it was time to question Jenny, she also pretended not to understand who was shown in the video. After talking with the detectives, during which they expressed their suspicions about the perpetrator's identity, Mrs. Jenny refused to answer any more questions and demanded a lawyer. It was at this moment that she was arrested on suspicion of killing her husband, which came as a shock to many people who knew this family. The entire community was divided into two groups. Some were convinced that the wife had shot her own husband. Others insisted that the police had made a mistake. Among those who believed in Jenny's innocence were her three daughters. While people discussed law enforcement actions, detectives obtained a warrant to search the Chance family home. They took all the electronics to try to find evidence of Jenny's guilt, but the examination would take time. After reviewing the footage and all other evidence presented by the investigation at that point, the county prosecutor's office refused to press charges against the deceased's wife. The district attorney's office ordered the case to be sent to the sheriff's office for further review. Therefore, after a five-day detention, Jenny was released from custody. For some reason, they also returned her late husband's car, the Black Mustang, to her. Prosecutors understood that due to the poor quality of the surveillance camera recordings and the lack of other evidence, it would be difficult for them to convince a jury of Jenny's guilt. She was released but she still remained the main and only suspect in this case. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you like this video. It's really important. The behavior on the footage, the characteristic gait, all pointed to Jenny, but detectives still had many questions that needed clarification. They needed to find evidence and a motive. After all, the Chance family, according to most acquaintances and neighbors, was a happy family that had celebrated their 17th wedding anniversary. They had wonderful children. They had recently returned from a family trip. The couple had been together for many years and no one had ever seen them seriously argue about anything. Unfortunately, the police really had nothing substantial except video recordings showing the perpetrator. But proving it was Jenny turned out to be problematic and the case reached a deadlock. However, the detectives were not going to give up. They spent several years searching for additional evidence and trying to build a case against Jenny and eventually succeeded. During their family vacation in Las Vegas, the Chance family visited a themed crime exhibition based on episodes of a popular TV show in the States. This in itself wasn't cause for suspicion, but it turned out that some of the high-profile criminal case fragments presented there were accurately reproduced in Todd's case. For example, the suspect's use of a payphone. This was done so that the perpetrator couldn't be tracked by their mobile phone. Another fragment talked about changing clothes. A woman took her own husband's life, then completely changed her clothes and shoes to avoid microscopic blood droplets being found on her. She disposed of the old clothes. This is exactly what the perpetrator did in the surveillance footage in Todd's case. It seemed that Jenny used this family vacation as inspiration and training on how she could take her husband's life and get away with it. But this isn't all the information the police managed to gather. In Todd's car, Jenny's fingerprints were found on the driver's door and her DNA on the gear shift. However, the woman insisted that she never drove her husband's car because it had a manual transmission. A legitimate question arose. How then could her prints have been left on the driver's side? Detectives also found surveillance footage showing Jenny in her usual appearance a few weeks before the incident making a purchase at a supermarket and trying to find out from the salesperson where she could use a payphone. This is strange, since the woman had two mobile phones. So for what purpose would she need a payphone? In her first meeting with detectives, Jenny stated that on the morning Todd was shot, she was at home working on her computer while her daughters slept. A check of the Chance family's home computer 
showed that there was no activity on it until 11 a.m. Consequently, the woman had lied to the police again. In essence, she had enough time to carry out the killing of her husband and return home. The surveillance footage was also shown to Todd and Jenny's daughters. The eldest, Jessica, initially recognized her mother in the footage. The girl stated that they had the same red backpack at home. Although later, when she realized she might inadvertently implicate her mom, Jessica retracted these words. The other two daughters, Sarah and Samantha, insisted that Jenny was at home at this time and couldn't have been captured on camera, so all of Todd's children were completely certain that their mom was innocent. Why would she hurt her own daughters by taking away the father they loved? Nevertheless, detectives still believed that Jenny was involved in her husband's death. She probably learned about the affair between Todd and his ex-fiancee, Carrie, and decided to punish her husband in such a cruel way. The second motive, more obvious, was a $500,000 life insurance policy. Since the woman earned significantly more in her managerial position than her husband, in case of divorce, she would have to pay him alimony, so ending the relationship wasn't a suitable option for her. In the end, Jenny managed to receive most of the life insurance policy payout. However, after a lengthy legal battle, everything else went to Todd's parents, Travis and Diana. They, in turn, gave this money to their granddaughters. Finally, after three years of trying to build a case and find irrefutable evidence, 49-year-old Leslie Jenny Chance was arrested and charged with killing her own husband. Her trial began in December 2016. On that tragic morning, Jenny and Todd went for a morning drive. Todd was behind the wheel. A woman in a baseball cap and large sunglasses covering her face sat in the passenger seat. They were seen leaving their family home together. While in the car, Jenny pointed a gun at her husband. He, obviously defending himself, instinctively stretched out his right hand. The bullet pierced the skin and muscles of his palm and hit his chest on the right side. Then the enraged wife, in close proximity to her victim, pulled the trigger again. After that, she dragged the lifeless body out of the car and dumped it in the almond grove. Most likely, Jenny didn't expect Todd to be found so quickly. After driving the Mustang to a troubled neighborhood, the woman wiped all surfaces in the car with disinfectant wipes she had brought with her. She left the gun on the floor, the keys on the seat, and simply walked away, hoping no one would notice her. Perhaps she wanted the car to be stolen. This would have further confused the investigation. The only thing Jenny didn't account for was that vigilant residents of the neighborhood would immediately report the abandoned Mustang to the police. Mrs. Jenny's lawyers relied on the alibi provided by her daughters, but Jenny herself initially said that the girls were asleep while she was working on the computer, so the alibi was deemed unconvincing. Real physical evidence that the woman was home that morning could have been her computer, but analysis showed there was no activity on it until 11 a.m. Jenny's own statement in court boiled down to her loving her husband and having no idea about his virtual romance with his ex-fiancee, Carrie Williams. The widow insisted that she was the main breadwinner of the family, so she didn't need Todd's insurance policy. Then Jenny admitted that she had very poor eyesight but never wore contact lenses, only regular glasses, and the stranger in the surveillance footage was wearing sunglasses. If it had been Jenny, she simply wouldn't have been able to see anything. However, prosecutors provided factual evidence that Mrs. Jenny had ordered contact lenses a month before her husband's death, and Jenny was caught in another lie. However, this didn't stop the woman, because in her first interview after the trial, she again told reporters about her poor eyesight and lack of contact lenses. After a prolonged court battle lasting four, five weeks on January 31st, 2020, the jury returned a guilty verdict which came as a huge shock to Jenny and her entire family. She never expected to be found guilty of this crime, and her daughters held the same opinion. The sentence was handed down only in September 2020. The judge sentenced Leslie Jenny Chance to a term of 50 years to life in prison, 25 years for killing her husband Todd Chance, and 25 years for using a firearm. Despite this, 
the woman still claims her innocence and has given numerous interviews where she tries to convince people that she was wrongfully convicted. Jenny attempted to appeal the verdict in January 2023, but it was upheld. Now she will not be eligible for parole until 2041. Family and acquaintances are still debating whether Jenny is guilty of her husband's death. One of the main points of contention in the case is that no blood traces were found in the car. It seems incredible that the woman could have cleaned the interior so thoroughly while still leaving her fingerprints on the gear shift. The second contentious point was that the authorities did not check what exactly the perpetrator threw into the dumpster, as these items could have become significant evidence in the case. On the other hand, Todd Chance was a simple man who spent all his time with his family. He didn't have vast wealth or real affairs on the side, if you don't count the correspondence with his ex-fiancee. So who really needed to take his life? This is the end of the story. Like the video and leave your thoughts in the comments. This was Jeremy. See you soon.